we do think we're still in a good is good environment. The more important thing for risk assets is not whether rates are going up or down. It's what's the broader economic and earnings backdrop. Maybe there's this narrowness creeping back into the market. The market is sort of punishing the more expensive stocks for the higher rate. I think we're in a, uh, a bull market and peak inflation, peak tightening, peak rates should be good for equities. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now and your bull market is celebrating its second anniversary. Where did that go? Two years since the ding-dong lows of October 2022, a move of more than 60% on the S&P 500. Equity futures, your scores to kick off the trading week look like this. We're positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we are up by two tenths. On the Russell, we're up by two tenths of 1% as well. We're still counting on the S&P 500, the 45th record high of the year. And the longest weekly winning streak on the S&P 500 going back to May. We've had five of them. Let's see if we can add some weight to that rally. The week ahead looks a little something like this. The highlight of the week for the earnings. Bank of America, Citi, Goldman for the data. U.S. retail sales on Thursday and for the central banks on the same day. Bramo, an ECB rate decision just around the corner. It just sort of underscores how much in the U.S. we're talking about that Goldilocks soft landing kind of moment, whether we see it edified by the earnings that you're talking about, really key. It shows how different it is over in Europe, where suddenly there is a new question around whether they're going to be fighting deflation, outright deflation that is imported from China and just what they're facing in general, how much they have to counter a return to the norm that was pre-pandemic. Let's talk about the latest out of China. The CSI 300 in Monday's session closing high by close to 2%. Really volatile session. Sokgen framed it as follows. China stimulus locked and loaded almost. The emphasis on almost this morning. There are a couple of questions. The headline figure, but also the emphasis, because there is a lot of emphasis on supporting things like home prices, which is something that they said they weren't going to do. They talked about how a lot of the bond offerings that they could put out there could go to financing fiscal stimulus. What I gather was Deutsche Bank and Goldman Sachs both raised their GDP forecast to 4.9 percent from 4.7 percent. But there is no longer lasting uh, kind of confidence. This is going to generate real growth, especially as there is deflation in PPI and you're seeing declines, disappointing uh, figures coming out of their export numbers. Well, let's take the forecast. You mentioned Goldman and Deutsche Bank 4.9 just south of 5%. 5% is the target. This feels like over the last week, the effort's really about putting a floor under growth. And clearly many people are convinced by that. The next step, what this market's hoping for, and to put the emphasis on markets and what traders are hoping for, is a whole lot more than that. Well, that's the reason why. It's not just a question of staving the losses or staving the pain. It's a question of what more can you do. And building bridges to nowhere and supporting house valuations isn't going to do it. So that raises a question of what is next in terms of fiscal stimulus. They have pledged to do things. They have said the right words. They haven't given headline numbers. They haven't given programs. And that's the reason why people are saying we're still wanting. At the same time, it starts to raise this question, how much is politically driven ahead of both what's going on in the U.S. with the election cycle, but also some of the tariffs coming out of Europe at a time where there's a really strong competition and a feeling that something's got to change with China's reliance on exports. A lot to work through this morning. Let's start with the day ahead, the year ahead. Coming up on this program, we'll catch up with Laurie Cabasino of RBC as the S&P 500 posts its 45th record high of the year. Sigrid de Vrij of ACEA as the Paris Motor Show kicks off and Johanna Chua of City as China promises more fiscal support. We begin this hour with stocks sitting at fresh all-time highs following a solid start to big bank earnings. Laurie Calvacina of RBC writing globally, our analysts have a slightly bullish tilt in their outlook for performance over the next 6 to 12 months. Within the US, performance outlooks on financials are most bullish, followed by materials and healthcare. Laurie's with us around the table. Laurie, good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Good to kick off the trading week with you. One of the big sectors that comes up repeatedly around this program, the financials. Yeah. People seem to like the financials. Earnings season has started. You, like me, like us, we look at the banks as some kind of read on the broader economy. Yeah. What's it telling you right now? So I thought the results we got on Friday affirmed the soft landing thesis. I mean, that's really all I was paying attention to, to be honest, when we were going through the transcript. Um, and I think, you know, we, we sort of heard, you know, on the one hand, the consumer is still pretty strong. We had one bank tell us, you know, we're eagerly looking for those signs of weakness 
areas and we're just not finding them. And I think that, you know, really reflects what a lot of us macro forecasters have been telling our own clients lately. Like we're looking at it, we hear all the concerns, we are just not seeing it in the data, we are just not hearing it from the companies. Which presents its own problem. You look at high yield spreads super tight, investment yeah. grade spreads super tight. The banks are saying nothing to see here, no problem. So as an investor, yeah. if you've been sat in cash, you're looking at stocks at all time highs, Credit spreads at very, very tight levels, and you're wondering yeah. what on earth do I do? What do I do? I think it's a question of your time horizons, right? And if I think about my own targeting process, we're a little bit over my 5,700 number right now for this year, um, and I feel pretty neutral in the short term. I don't feel bearish by any stretch, but valuations feel full, sentiment feels pretty full to me. AAII hit, I think it was 24% on the four week average last week, 28% on the one week number. That's a one standard deviation event. So I don't necessarily feel like you need to be chasing at this particular moment. That being said, when I walk through the valuation math for next year, if I keep a pretty steady multiple um, and I just bake in earnings growth, assume a pretty good economy, I can get to 6,200 easily. Um, on my, you know, I have a below consensus earnings number of 269 now. If I use consensus earnings, which is over 280, I can get you to like 6,500, 6,600. So I think you buy dips is the way to think about it. Um, and I think if you don't really care about the short term, sure, you know, maybe you can go ahead and hold your nose and buy. There is a question about uh, which dips do you buy because yeah. there has been a very segmented market where you have basically big tech rotating in and yeah. out of favor and then you have the rest of the 493 that are playing catch up in fits and starts. How much do you lean into the sort of rotation, this broadening out trade at a time where you do see some earnings growth, but it's patchy? So look, I think if you're thinking about the rest of the S&P 500, X the MAG 7, I feel much better about that right now than necessarily small caps. Um, but I do think the earnings need to come through. And we're in just sort of this weird earnings growth environment right now for the bits and pieces. And I think that's why the leadership handoff has been such, you know, fits and starts. So MAG 7 earnings growth is decelerating on forward estimates. However, those estimates have been improving recently. Um, if you look at the rest of the market, those estimates have been stagnating. So so, you know, on the one hand, we've got this decelerating earnings growth environment for this previously hot part of the market, and that makes everything very jittery, right? It makes us vulnerable to downside, but it's fighting back very hard. I need the other side of the market, the financials, the energy companies, we need them to fight back harder this reporting season. One thing that struck me about the earnings that we heard in particular from JP Morgan, but also from Wells Fargo, is just the lack of clarity, the lack of visibility. Yeah. And I'm guessing we're going to hear that more from other yeah. companies. We have already. How difficult does that make your job? It, it makes it very difficult. And on the one, you know, I was talking to someone about corporate confidence over the weekend, and I said, on the one hand, you know, there's this resilience, the faith and the ability to execute and control what you can control. On the other hand, you know, we are seeing companies talk time and time again about uncertainty from things, you know, about the path of interest rates. Well, we thought we settled that, maybe not. Let's see. Um, we've got the election coming up, and you know, I asked a company this recently I, at one of our conferences, and I said, what are people waiting for? You know, with this election, what outcome? Do they want what policy issues are they focused on? And eventually the company said, well, I think they just want the event to pass. So, you know, our customers know what they're dealing with. Um, and I think that for better or worse is where we are. And we heard one of the banks actually allude to that idea on Friday as well. Can we stay on that theme? Do you sense a real sense of paralysis that people are really holding back, just waiting for this event to clear? So if I think about the hedge funds, um, I don't get the impression they have been doing a lot. They may be starting to do more now that we're within a 30 day window. You are seeing the VIX move up a little bit. That indicates to me that maybe the fast money crowd is starting to do a bit more. If I think about my long only clients, you know, I had one person say to me recently, said, I don't know what's going to happen on, on the election, you know, on election. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. How can I possibly do anything right now? And so so I do on that kind of longer term money, I do see, I, I don't know if I call it paralysis, but I see healthy wait and see. And whether we actually get an outcome. I say waiting for this event to clear. I've got no idea how long it takes for this event to clear. It could be weeks. Well, could I think it's, it, it's the election outcome itself. Are we going to go and fight it in the court system the way we did back in 2000? Now, what's interesting about 2000 is we did not get our typical sell off heading into the election. We also didn't get our typical pop after the election. And we, I think we actually resolved that pretty early on in December. And the market still never got, you know, that sort of relief bounce. So that's something to watch in here as well. But let's even take it a step further. The legislative process is how long laws are determined. I feel like I keep having to remind people this who don't sit in the U.S. Um, it's, it's not so much, you know, if Anne-Marie were here, right, this laundry list, this, you know, 
that they're all throwing out. These are just negotiating points and ideas. We have to actually see what Congress is going to look like. We have to see which of this laundry list they actually care most about. And, you know, if they're going to pick and choose a couple of things, what are those things going to be? So we're going to be waiting and seeing for a while. The paralysis that you're talking about implies almost uh, binary outcomes yeah. or potentially very different outcomes between one candidate and another or between yeah. one legislative outcome or another. How different are the ranges of outcomes that people are trying to map out in the C-suite? So, you know, it, it, it's funny. I probably have a slightly different view on this. I only look at policy. I don't look at personality. And we've gone through and just really tried to compare all the campaign documents, not what they're saying in every single rally, but what's actually been put on websites, what's been put on papers, what's been said on dedicated economic speeches. And I do feel like there are some clear differences on things like corporate tax policy, things like energy policy. Um, but tariffs, I feel like, you know, as opposed to them being, you know, left and right, Right? It's sort of on one side of the spectrum, you know, with different extremes. Um, I do feel like I'm not seeing either candidate necessarily talk a lot about in what I call sort of industrial related stimulus, which was a big feature of the last two campaigns, sort of reinvesting in infrastructure and things like that. I'm seeing a lot of consumer led initiatives. So I feel like, you know, we're, we're kind of ending up on the same page on a lot of things. Like they're both talking about things like home building. What strikes me is when we talk about what the big fears are of people, they talk about geopolitics, they talk about the unknown around uh, the potential outcome of the election, they talk about interest rates. And then you look at things like the AAII investor yeah. survey, and there's an incredible amount of confidence. You yeah. take a look at what they're buying, there's an incredible amount of confidence. Yeah. Where is this paralysis showing up? If the consumer is still spending and companies are reporting good earnings, where is it showing up? I think part of it is maybe coming from overseas. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that Russell 2000 futures positioning on the CFTC data has suddenly just surged, right? And that's when people, that tends to happen when people want to make domestic bets on the U.S. It's moving up in a similar fashion to what we saw in 2016 on the Trump win, um, if you looked at 2017 on tax reform, if you looked at 2018 on the trade war. So those were mostly domestic U.S. trades. Um, my colleague Elsa, Elsa Linos told me recently that she's seen sort of a similar kind of sudden upward move in dollar positioning. So I feel like maybe we're starting to get some U.S. bets that are being made again. Just a subtle shift towards the former president, Donald Trump? I, it's hard to say. I mean, we've looked at how S&P 500 is trading in regards to Trump in the betting markets. From 2023 through the middle of 2024, it was a very tight, powerful correlation. It broke down the last couple months. And I think we have to watch right now with the, the betting markets starting to shift. You're not really seeing the national polling averages shift yet. I think they probably will. Um, but we have to see if markets are recoupling with Trump. It's not clear yet. Things are still super tight. Laurie, it's good to see you. Good to see you Laurie too. Laurie Cavacina of RBC with a phrase of the year, I think, regarding the election, staring at the sun. I think for all of us, it's been like staring at the sun. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Four Israeli soldiers were killed and dozens more were injured after a drone struck a military base in northern Israel. The attack marks one of the deadliest strikes from Hezbollah in at least a year. Shortly afterward, Israel Israeli strikes on southern and central Lebanon killed at least 51 people that, according to local health officials, it's one of the deadliest single days for the country in recent weeks. The UK International Investment Summit is underway in London. The Labour government is looking to draw leaders of tech, PE and finance. Among G7 nations, the UK has lagged peers in foreign direct investment since the pandemic. Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders will be sitting down with the UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And SpaceX has pulled off an incredible technological feat on Sunday after launching its Starship rocket into orbit. The company achieved its first ever chopsticks landing, catching the rocket over 200 foot fall booster out of the air with giant mechanical arms at the launch site. The recovery marked a historic milestone for spaceflight with the use reusability of the rocket booster seen as a critical step towards developing more advanced space travel. SpaceX ex expects full reusability to drastically lower the cost of launching future Starship missions. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes. Just absolutely phenomenal. Congratulations to Elon Musk and the team over at SpaceX. You know when something looks unreal and it looks like a video on Rewind? That's what that looked like. It oh, just doesn't look real. Exactly. It looked like my child's project when they say, like, this is what I seem to do. And they Photoshop something in and then they hand it to their kid, their, uh, their teacher. I mean, honestly, it looked like one of those games where you throw up a ball and catch it in a little wand. I mean, it's just sort of shocking. And this country is capable of some amazing things. Up next on the program, the election race continues to tighten. By the way, we're leading.
in all the polls, but we have to win. Too big to rig. We are nearing the home stretch. We are nearing the home stretch. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500, firmer here by two tenths of one percent. The Treasury market closed today for Columbus Day, so you're not going to see cash treasuries. But you will see a lot of things happening elsewhere. Commodities down by close to three percent on WTI, and likewise on Brent. Various reports about various targets for Israel in Iran, but ultimately still another weekend. Bramo has passed, and no action. Still waiting. For retaliation. There has been no action. However, there was a pretty big action from the United States in, in terms of shipping an anti-missile type of protective device to Israel, which indicates that maybe they're preparing for some sort of action that could prompt some retaliation, and they're gritting for that. Brent crude down by 2.6%, 76.98 on Brent this morning. Under surveillance this morning, the election race continues to tighten. By the way, we're leading in all the polls, but we have to win. Too big to rig. We're leading in the polls, but we have to do it too big to rig. Because they are good at one thing. You know what that one thing is? Here you go, cheating. That's true. They're, they're professional thieves. We have 23 days until Election Day. And we are nearing the home stretch. We are nearing the home stretch. So here's the latest new polling showing Donald Trump closing the gap with Kamala Harris with just over three weeks remaining until Election Day. As pressure builds, tensions reportedly rising between Team Harris and Team Biden. Axios reporting some on the Harris team say that top White House aides aren't sufficiently coordinating Biden's messaging and schedule to align with what's best for the vice president's campaign. Joining us now from the nation's capital, Bloomberg's Michael Shepard. Shep, can we start with that story? What did you make of that Axios story over the weekend? Well, there's no question, Jonathan, that there are still a lot of bruised feelings between the two camps. The Biden camp, namely, in particular, foreseeing the president that they've worked for for so many years, pushed out of the race, in essence, following his disastrous debate performance in June that cast questions about his mental acuity and fitness for office and whether he'd be able to defeat Trump. Now, on the other hand, for the Harris camp, they feel that the president, in trying to hold on to the nomination, uh, had suggested that he and only he was capable of beating Trump, and therefore she was not able to. Now, we do see in the polls that she maintains this slight lead, but it is, it is shrinking, according to some of these surveys, including the key swing states that we've been watching very closely. So these tensions that we're seeing play out uh, kind of indicate just where we are in the race and just what a fraught moment it is. It also, for me, recalls what we saw during the Clinton-Gore cam uh, Gore campaign in 2000, where he asked then-President Clinton to not campaign in swing states out of concern that he might actually undermine the candidate, Al Gore. Chef, I think we need to get into what this is all about. When they talk about complaints about the schedule, reminds me of last week when we had the vice president on The View and the sitting president was conducting a news conference regarding the hurricanes. Now, one is certainly far more important than the other. And the vice president was trying to make out that Governor DeSantis wasn't taking her calls for partisan reasons. At the same time, the president was saying that they had a good relationship, that they were getting everything they need from one side and the other side was getting everything they need from them. Is that what this is really all about the last week or is it more than that? Uh, there is a little bit of concern, and this is there's always a tension between the president and their number two about who is stepping on whom. Uh, the president is the one who is running the country, leading the ticket, and the voice for the White House. So it is always an awkward relationship for the president to have their vice president out on the campaign trail and therefore taking the uh, center stage role in politics for the party. You did mention, Mike, that a lot of this has to do with where we are in the election cycle, and you can definitely feel a nervousness percolating up in the Democratic Party. We're speaking with Isaac Botansky of BTIG later uh, in a couple hours, and he said he still thinks right now that Donald Trump has the advantage because of two particular issues, the economy and immigration and border security. So how much are those two issues really dominating a lot of the discussion as the sort of twilight of the campaign trail commences? 
Well, the economy has remained an issue that has worked to Donald Trump's advantage in this campaign, although Kamala Harris has, con has managed to close the gap on that in recent polling. Our own Bloomberg News morning consult poll of the seven swing states that we have surveyed shows that she has been closing that gap and uh, in showing more uh, uh, ability to connect with voters on the, uh, on the issues of the economy and in ways that signals that she cares about where they are. Uh, some of her plans, uh, uh, including uh, tax cuts, her uh, offer of housing assistance nationwide, have resonated with some voters, allowing her to make up some ground that Biden had lost to Trump in the polling when it came to the economy. And immigration, of course, is a signature issue for the former president. It helped get him elected in 2016. And we saw on Friday and Saturday and Sunday how he returned to it again and again and again. Again, really trying to conjure up once more those vibes about how he would, with strong border policies, try to save the nation from uh, what he sees as a moment of peril. Chip, I want to circle back to the clip that we saw at the very beginning where Donald Trump was talking about uh, how the other side likes to cheat and, and that, that everybody needs to get out to vote. In an interview with Maria Bartiromo over the weekend, he talked about how the bigger problem is the enemy within. He said, we have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics going on saying it should be handled very easily, if necessary, by the National Guard or by the military. What's been the reaction to those comments? Well, the reaction has been that once again, we see the former president raising these claims without offering any evidence. And in, on immigration, for instance, he did the same thing on Friday in Aurora, Colorado, uh, saying outright that the city had been overrun by immigrant gangs when local authorities said that was uh, completely not true and that uh, any issues that they had had with, uh, with gangs were confined to one local apartment complex and did not reflect the state of safety in the city overall. So he offered this uh, suggestion, hint, that there could be violence on Election Day without providing evidence and also glossing over the fact that the violence that occurred in 2021 following the 2020 election was largely perpetrated by his own supporters on January 6th here in Washington. Shep, with that in mind, as we enter the final days, where do you expect to be the biggest push from either campaign? Well, right now we're seeing this week the Democratic ticket, uh, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, pushing in the blue wall states of the industrial north, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Uh, they are trying to make inroads there with voters, but particularly with black voters. And they are concerned that the support among African-Americans may be softening. This is a Democratic constituency that's been reliable over the years. But a New York Times poll released over the weekend indicated that as many as 15 percent of likely voters could be uh, black voters could be tilting toward Trump. And that is an increase in the Republicans' favor of more than six percentage points. So they are worried about this. So a number of the events that they have scheduled in these so-called blue wall industrial states are geared to gin up enthusiasm among black voters to ensure not only that they uh, agree to vote for Harris, but actually turn out on election day to ensure that if the election is close, they have enough votes to pull it out in each of those states. Shep, do you think some of those men approve and appreciate being accused of misogyny instead of addressing the policy differences that some of those men might feel? And I think you're referring to the comments that uh, former President Barack Obama made in trying to shore up support for Kamala Harris, where he was uh, pointedly speaking to black men, trying to say, uh, guys, we need to be on Kamala's side. If you have any misgivings about electing a black woman as president, please set those aside. But some of his comments seem to not have gone down quite as well. So Kamala Harris may have a little bit of cleanup work to do at each of these events, trying to ensure that she is there for uh, black male voters as well. Shep, it's good to hear from you, sir. Down in Washington, D.C., Michael Shepard with the latest. It felt like a tricky road to start going down. The former president started going down it, and inevitably there's blowback ever since in the days after. One thing that Kamala Harris has tried to do is not make this about the fact that she's a woman and that uh, it, she doesn't want to make it about identity politics. And so this kind of brought it right into the fore. Did you see uh, Michael Che on uh, Saturday Night Live, what he said? I don't watch SNL. You what don't happened? watch? No. OK, well, it, he basically said 78 percent. Don't blame us. <laughs> he said that you can't blame us for uh, for any lackluster support. Look, I think that this is going to be something where each candidate is parsing every single vote 
And so you're going to have some very confusing messages coming out as each of those votes try to be uh, sort of round in. A few more weeks to go. Up next on this program, Secret DeVry of the ACEA joining us from the Paris Motor Show as European automakers face what many consider to be the perfect storm. Equity futures on the S&P up by two tenths from New York. Good morning. Five weeks of gains on both the S&P 500 and on the Nasdaq 100 as well. The longest weekly winning streak going back to May of this year. Equity futures on the S&P 500 adding a little bit of weight to the rally up by two tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100 up by about a third of one percent on a rustle of the small caps up by a quarter. If you switch up the board and get to foreign exchange last week the dollar index DXY posting a second consecutive week of strength. We have not done that since the end of June. It's been that long. The euro's negative again. We're down a tenth of one percent. Pound sterling off by a tenth as well, as well. With the dollar stronger against the bulk of G10 for the euro, it's going to be about the ECB decision on Thursday. For pound sterling, we counted you down to a big budget taking place later this month. Look out for this conversation later in about three hours' time. The Prime Minister. Keir Starmer sitting down with Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders, and we need to work out if he's so committed to growth, how is he going to engineer it? He's talked a lot about pain. He's talked a lot about cutting back. He's talked about the potential for everybody to accepting that, to, to be accepting that. If that's the case, where is the growth going to come from? And where is he going to really attract business back to a country while also raising taxes and creating some more punitive levies? These are some of the questions that I'm very curious to hear the answers to. It's a big couple of weeks for the British economy. Look out for that. That's who currency pairs to look forward to for the rest of this week. Let's turn to crude, to WTI and to Brent as well. We're pulling back by a little more than 2%. Brent crude is 77.20, WCI down to 73.68. Some NBC reporting over the weekend that US officials believe Israel has narrowed down what they will target in their response to Iran's attack. With these officials described as Iranian military and energy infrastructure, but no final decision has been made. And this is a waiting game and has been now for more than a week. You know, I really enjoyed uh, Halima Croft. She came out with a piece over the weekend where she was talking about essentially people will probably sell oil if there is some sort of Israeli strike that avoids the mass amounts of oil reserves that Iran has. But that's probably going to be a head fake in her mind because she thinks this is just the beginning of a tit for tat and escalation. How this gets priced in is very difficult. The fact is that the commodity market tends to only buy or sell when there is some sort of catalyst. So expect a big move one way or another should we get a move that really surprises one way or another in terms of the oil. It's super hard because if they do strike energy infrastructure, are you just accounting for Iranian barrels that might be at risk or are you thinking about the whole region being at risk and they've got a very, very different oil market. But that's exactly it, right? Escalation, uh, the ultimate would be uh, the Straits of Hormuz. And if they essentially cut off all oil transport through one of the main uh, sort of arteries of all of that transport, there's a lot unknown here. We do know that it's going to escalate at some point. And how do people trade around it? They wait until they have more clarity, and that didn't come over the weekend. Crude a bit softer this morning, down by more than 2%, $77 and about 24 cents on Brent crude. Under surveillance this morning, Chinese stocks rebounding from their worst week since late July, with the CSI 300 index notching its biggest gain in nearly a week. Traders are waiting more details after the country's finance minister hinted at greater government borrowing to shore up the economy. But we didn't get a number, so we're still waiting, and you might have to wait a few more weeks. We didn't get a number, but we also didn't get details. We didn't get a sense of exactly what they were going to support other than some rhetoric that gave people confidence that a lot more was coming in terms of just how they were going to finance it. But to me, I really want to understand how are they going to support growth? It's one thing to say they're not going to miss their target by as much. It's another thing to say we're actually laying the groundwork for consumers to have more confidence to go out there and spend because what we're seeing right now is steady deflation and that has not abated. So one step at a time, local governments, local authorities have not been able to sell land. And that's been a big source of revenue for a long, long time. So property developers and what happens with local governments has been a big theme at the local level. What they established over the weekend was just a mechanism to tackle that problem. That's the first step. The second step, what we're all waiting for, what this market is hungry for, is not just putting a floor under growth. It's providing incentives for consumption. We're going to have to wait. The Chinese finance minister over the weekend said the central government still has quite large room to borrow and increase the deficit. That's putting a floor under things. I think after that, 
That's the next step, the next two, three, four, five steps down the road. Especially since Xi Jinping's administration has been reluctant to really say we are going to give payments directly to consumers. They don't want to follow the American style of things. They think that there's a warning in some of the inflation that popped up after uh, the pandemic. That said, they're fighting deflation. And this is why I think it's really interesting to see whether that is sort of the new norm and what that does to the European economy versus the U.S. economy that's a little bit more separated from what goes on in China. Watch this space. More on this conversation in about 15 minutes time on this program. Let's get you up to speed on Boeing, planning to cut its global workforce by about 10 percent or roughly 17,000 positions. The CEO telling workers in a memo the cuts will include executives, managers and employees. The company also announcing five billion dollars in charges across its commercial airplanes and defense businesses. That stock is down again this morning. We're lower by more than two percent. Honestly, they can't catch a break. This is a company that just keeps getting worse and worse in terms of the outlook. There is a new CEO. Does this give him carte blanche to make some hard decisions? Right now, usually job cuts leave stocks higher because that's reducing the overhead. In this case, it's not. And I take that from a message of how much do they need the expertise that a lot of these workers have and how do they get out of a slump that ultimately comes not from uh, overcapacity, but rather the opposite and a lack of production expertise and frankly, skill. Your observation is the important one. The stock's not high this morning. Not enough. Yeah. Far more needs to be done to put a floor under this company. There needs to be something structural to give people confidence that there aren't going to keep being snafus and that, frankly, the outlook isn't going to keep getting worse. And ultimately, that has to come to production ramping up, some sort of resolution to some of the other probes so that we understand what the actual problem stem for because we, from because we actually don't even know that at this point. Speaking of bad outlooks, let's talk about Europe. Analysts in a Bloomberg poll saying Germany is suffering a mild recession and output across the whole of 2024 will be flat. Respondents seeing GDP shrinking 0.1% in the third quarter following a surprise contraction of that magnitude in the second quarter. Looking ahead to the ECB, how can't they cut interest rates on Thursday? And if they don't, and we've said it on this program, if they don't, that news conference will be absolutely fascinating. How do you justify not? Right now, the market's basically saying they will cut rates. My question is, how much more are they going to signal that they're going to cut rates? Because essentially, at a certain point, not only is the ECB uh, trying to figure out how to perfectly land this economy, the economy has landed and then some. The inflation rate is below their target already, albeit only for a couple of months or a month. But a real question is, going forward, are they trying to land a soft landing? Or are they trying to avoid another type, another bout of deflation that they saw pre-pandemic? At the heart of all of this is the automakers, so let's talk about them. European automakers facing what many people are considered to be a perfect storm. Rising costs, disappointing EV sales and increasing regulation. Sigrid de Vries, the Director General of the European Automobile Manufacturers Association, joins us now from the Paris Motor Show. Sigrid, welcome to the programme. We've had profit warnings from VW, from BMW, from Stellantis. Can you just start by telling us what is going wrong? for European automakers? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of things going right. The vehicles are there. We have an ambitious trajectory towards decarbonization, but demand is lagging. So, uh, yeah, and that's what we're witnessing uh, today in Europe, also elsewhere in the world. Consumers need a bit more time to really be ready for this uh, enormous transformation to electrification. And, and that's what we're seeing. This is not a, a straightforward transformation. There are uh, obstacles to overcome and that's also what we see here and now in Europe. Sigrid, how important are lower cost electric vehicles to that transformation? Sorry, can you say that again? How important are what? Our lower cost, our, our cars that don't cost as much, uh, that are electric vehicle vehicles uh, that people can buy, how much is that essential to this transformation? It is essential, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. People need to be able to use these vehicles. They need to be able to charge electricity at home, at work, along the road. Uh, they need cheap and green electricity to, uh, to put into their vehicles. They need to change their mindset. This is a different way of using your mobility than they were used to. So price definitely is important, but it's certainly not the only part of the equation. The reason why I ask this is because recently uh, the EU decided to pass a 40 45% or up to a 45% tariff on uh, in vehicles imported from China. There has been concerns that this will actually increase the cost of domestic vehicles being sold in the electric, uh, in the EV space. How much is that a concern of yours that that could set the transformation back? 
No, I don't think that's a concern because prices need to go down. I think manufacturers started serving the more premium segments of the market, which they typically do with newer technologies. So they need to um, make more models available also in the lower and mid size price segments. Um, and that's what they are doing, actually. We expect a lot of model launches. We've seen some last year, this year, and now next year also to come. So um, I, I don't think that's the predominant issue there. Sigurd, we'll catch up with the Stellantis CEO in about an hour from now. And we've had a conversation with him about the overcapacity in Europe. We've crunched the numbers here at Bloomberg. If you look at the top five, the big five automakers in Europe, and I'm sure you're familiar with these figures, nearly one third of major car plants are producing half the vehicles that they have the capacity to make. Are we at this point where they've got to make a decision to lay people off and cut capacity? Can they hold on with that capacity for much longer? Well, it is indeed an issue. I mean, we're still more than 2 million vehicles below pre-pandemic levels. So there is overcapacity. That is an issue that needs to be addressed. And that's why it's so important to really note that this time around, the market is lagging, demand is lagging. So we need to sell more of these vehicles, European, also from elsewhere. And, and that will, will help. But you need purchase incentives. You need ch charging infrastructure to make this transformation work. And I think so only with a concerted, a joint effort, Effort, can we really uh, get where we want to be and also um, take care of overcapacity issues? It sounds like the burden then for now is on national governments and they've got a big decision to make. Either they provide state aid, they roll out the infrastructure quicker, or these car companies as private organisations accountable to shareholders are going to have to cut capacity. Sigrid, do you think that national governments are aware of that? If they had a sufficient reality check to make that decision anytime soon? Well, I think indeed reality check is the name of the game. I think mean, the policy makers really need to step up their game. As I said before, they've set targets without really a, a, a holistic plan to also accommodate the transformation. The, the, the vehicles are there, vehicles are not the bottleneck, but now there needs to be a market uh, stimulated, uh, created. I mean, we're, we're at the point where we're going from first movers, early adopters to really mass market uh, adoption of these, of these electric vehicles. And that is not a straightforward trajectory. So policymakers need to step up their game, need to step in. Uh, and it's not just about state aid. I mean, it's really more about creating, stimulating that market encouragement to, to get these vehicles on the roads. But indeed, it takes a concerted effort and policymakers are, um, are on call. What do you think auto manufacturers in Europe will have to do if there aren't purchase incentives or programs like that, as you were mentioning? Well, I mean, they have several ways to meet their targets because in, in essence, in Europe, there's a sales target for, set for vehicle manufacturers. So they can pull with other manufacturers, they can pay penalties, they can cut production or they lower their prices. Those are basically the four major compliance mechanisms to meet the, the targets set by the law here in Europe. So none of them are attractive, right? And and, and a lot of, 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 the, of the problem today is caused by a lagging demand. So manufacturers really need to yeah, use all these levers that they have, um, but it's, it's, it, it will deliver a disproportionate cost of compliance beyond the, um, the, the, the beyond manufacturers uh, doing. And, and that is why we are also here in Europe, as I say, are sounding this alarm bell so loudly. We need action now and, and infrastructure build out will take too long. It's not an immediate effect. Purchase incentives might. You see also when they're taken away, how the market again drops. So there, there's a number of measures that need to be taken. And, and, and we stand ready, Our my members stand ready to, to deliver. And you can see it here also in Paris at the show. But it's really urgent that we now get our act together. Could sense that urgency. Thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Sigrid de Vries there of ACEA. We'll catch up with the Stellantis CEO at 8.10 Eastern time. Do not miss that conversation. Carlos Tavares just around the corner. Team here at Bloomberg has done a wonderful job of breaking down this data. I'll repeat that stat for you again. Nearly one third of major passenger car plants from Europe's five largest automakers. So that's BMW, Mercedes, Stellantis, Renault and VW were underutilized last year. That's a major problem, the overcapacity across the continent. And just to put this into perspective about why this is so central to the European economy, the auto manufacturing industry in Europe employs some 13 million people. This is not a small figure and goes to the heart of the economic engine. We're on this story a little bit later this morning. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg brief. Let's cross over to Danny Berger. Hey, Danny.
Hey, John. Darren Achimolu, Simon Johnson, and James A. Robinson were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for research into how institutions are formed and affect prosperity. The three economists will share a $1.1 million award. Last year, Claudia Golden received the award for her research into gender pay gaps. The year before that, it was Fed Chair Ben Bernanke who shared the award with Douglas Diamond and Philip Divig for research on banks and financial crisis. The Singapore government has blocked a proposed $1.7 billion deal by Allianz to buy a majority stake in homegrown firm Income Insurance. The government decided it wouldn't be in the best public interest for the deal, deal to proceed in its current form. The city-state isn't satisfied that Income can fulfill its social mission as a cooperative after the acquisition. The approval of any revised deal lies with the country's financial regulator. And as you guys were talking about, cracks have already appeared in the Eurozone's labor market after years of unexpected resilience, pressuring the ECB to lower rates. Some major companies have begun offloading staffs, working fear of a sudden deterioration that could further rattle the region. Economists at Goldman Sachs predict that the euro area unemployment rate will rise to 6.7 percent over the next several quarters. And that's your brief. John. Hey, Danny, thank you. I think the question around the governing council of the ECB has changed. It's not about why should we cut interest rates. Why shouldn't we cut interest rates, given the backdrop in Europe right now? And how far should we cut them? This really goes to the heart of what I think is sort of this curiosity of the dollar weakness and how long the euro can remain strong, given the fact that people are talking about a potential neutral rate of 2.5% in the euro region at the highest end versus some 3.5% over in the U.S. Euro dollar right now, 109.25, slightly weaker euro on the screen. Up next on the program, China putting a floor under growth. We've had a big stimulus um, on the fiscal side um, and monetary policy side. So we now expect GDP to grow 4.7% next year in China. That conversation up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Equity futures on the S&P up by two tenths of one percent after posting the 45th all-time high of the year so far on the S&P 500 in Friday's session. We add just a little bit more weight to it. In the FX market, the euro 109.25, negative a tenth of one percent, going into the ECB rate decision on Thursday. As we've said repeatedly through the morning, how can't they cut interest rates given the backdrop in Europe right now? And just to round things out, crude down by 2.3 percent, 73.76 on WTI. Under surveillance this morning, China putting a floor under growth. We've had a big stimulus um, on the fiscal side um, and monetary policy side. So we now expect GDP to grow 4.7% next year in China. The demographics, the large debt um, and deglobalization and um, none of that will be changed and impacted by the fiscal package that has been announced. So here's the latest this morning. Chinese stocks rebounding after the finance minister announced details to support the property sector, but stopped short of giving a headline number for fiscal stimulus. Joanna Choi of City writing, fiscal policy remains the key thing to watch in terms of timing. The next few days could still be a window for some guidance from the Ministry of Finance, while the MPC Standing Committee at the end of this month could be a window for action. Joanna joins us now for more. Joanna, good morning. It's good to see Hi, you. Hi, good morning. Welcome to New York City. Yeah, good timing to be, to be here. here. Yes. Good timing to be here after the weekend. Let's just start from 35,000 feet, the highlights of the announcements that we got on Saturday. What were the big ones for you? Look, I think the market obviously seems a bit confused and kind of divided in how to interpret the press, uh, press conference. Because I think people were looking for three main things. One is you were looking for kind of a headline numerical figure. Obviously, people outside were looking for that, and we didn't get that numerical figure. Second is people were looking for the details of the comp composition of fiscal support. And I think there's a lot of expectation and hope that there, there may be some more demand support for welfare and consumer spending, uh, consumption support. And that, you know, I think the composition was a little bit uh, underwhelming because we only really got a little bit on the student subsidies, and there was a lot more focus on local government and property support, which is important, but we were missing that demand support consumption angle. And then the third thing people were looking for was forward guidance. And I think this is where there is a bit of a difference, because on the first two, they kind of disappointed or underwhelmed, but I thought on the forward guidance actually was quite you know, positive and supportive. So the Minister of Finance gave a very decisive kind of statement that there was enough room on debt and deficit for the central government to kind of provide support. And I thought that the forward guidance in terms of local government debt support 
support, including potentially the large, you know, providing enough bond quota for the largest ever government debt swap, and the fact that they also talked about being able to use special bond quota to buy up unused, uh, kind of uh, to buy up unsold housing and land, so that property and the use of the bond quota for property support was also as a forward guidance was also more positive. So on the three piece, the first two, the numerical, the composition and consumption, kind of missing. But the forward guidance, I think that still has a little bit of more, more hope, more supportive stance. And that's where you get a bit of a divergence between like onshore markets seeing this as a little bit of a positive hope and then offshore kind of being disappointed because they're focused on the first two factors. Well, let's focus on the third factor. Let's talk about the guidance. Help me understand the difference between ability and willingness. What the Ministry of Finance did for me over the weekend was demonstrate an ability to act if they need to. Have you seen a sufficient demonstration of willingness to do more? And are you expecting that in the coming weeks? So, I mean, I definitely, I've always felt that it was always a, a, a willingness rather than ability. And the fact that they came out to express and emphasize that the Ministry of Finance, central government, has the ability was kind of reassuring. I thought the tone of the finance minister in that press conference was also kind of reassuring. Now, in terms of willingness, I mean, we're going to have to see further. I think, obviously, people are still very divided because we didn't have the numbers. So people were not really sure. And we were waiting still for the NPC because, obviously, end of the month, that's when we're going to get further details. But the important thing is we also probably need to a little bit wait for the Central Economic Work Conference in December and then for 2025. Because if there's going to be a revision for the budget, as I said, they said there's a lot of room on the deficit and the debt. It wasn't really clear we're going to get a deficit revision for this year. But if they're going to do some revision on the deficit and debt next year, that obviously will be more supportive for 2025. And then the details will be at the NPC meeting in 2025. But we should get a little bit of early guidance uh, on the Central Economic Work Conference. And like I said, at the end of the month, you know, when we get the NPC meeting, we're going to get more guidance for this year. So we're not giving up on the possibility they'll still give some $2 trillion remnant be support. It's just not clear how much of it will be on budget, off budget, and then we're going to have to wait a little bit more for 2025 in terms of the support. All that being said, uh, there is sort of a deepening of the, we're seeing of deflation. We saw exports coming in lighter than expected, so that part of the engine isn't really there. There's a question as people revise upward their growth expectations for China, it still is below what yes. the target is. Have we gotten confidence that this administration has reprioritized the economy over certain national goals that they were basically uh, prioritizing that was the reason that they held off for so long on stimulus in the first place? Look, there's definitely been a pivot. I mean, there's definitely been signals since the September 24th uh, joint press conference with PBOC. There's clearly a pivot of trying to prevent kind of a vicious kind of spiral downward and providing a bit of a floor. But you're absolutely right. I think the reason why market is very divided and concerned is I think there is still lack of detail of kind of new demand support, especially, as you said, deflationary pressures. I mean, we had core inflation over the weekend that was just barely, you know, it was barely averting deflation. It was like 0.1, which is the lowest that we've had uh, since, I think, March of 2021. So really, you know, obviously, the consumption support, that one, I think, was a little underwhelming. And I was a bit disappointed that the only thing we got in terms of details was like student subsidies. Like, you know, I think people were hoping for something more given the stress. So you're right. It seems like, obviously, local government finances and the constraints of of abrupt fiscal tightening because local governments are losing, you know, revenues are not enough to offset the spending and they're cutting. That obviously is making things worse. So they are providing a little bit more guidance. But even in this press conference, we only got uh, 400, they mentioned 400 billion renminbi using unutilized bond quota to support local government. And 400 billion renminbi, we think for this year, is still too small relative to the 1.4 trillion revenue shortfall they've had in January to August. So you're right. It seems like, I mean, there's a little bit of forward guidance, but the details still, I mean, I think there's still a lot of concern. It's not enough to provide a sufficient floor and support on demand. Got 20 seconds before I hit the break. Just quickly, have you upgraded your GDP target for 2025? No, I, I think it's too early at this point. It's too premature. I mean, let alone 2024, which I know other competitors have because it's already October. But I think 2025, we really need to see more details. So we'll have to wait and hold out. Got it. And oh, you all, we also have a pivotal election coming up in November. And that's something we need to watch out for. <laughs> it is too. right here in the United States. Joanna Joy. Of City. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Coming up next on this program, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo, Isaac Boltanski of BTIG, Neela Richardson of ADP, and Oshin Kwan of Bank of America. The second hour of Bloomberg surveillance just around the corner. With equity futures on the SP 500 just about positive on a five week winning streak, we had some weight to that rally this morning up by about two tenths of 1%. That was
The market has been trying to push in too much policy accommodation. You do need to see earnings estimates continue to rise, we think, in order to support the market. We're expecting that the S&P can maintain a higher than traditional valuation setup premised on much more resilient fundamentals than many would have thought. Investors probably have to link the time horizons. It's just not as beneficial anymore to be as near-term focused. I don't think after a bull market, so to speak, in both equity and credit that has lasted this long, has not sucked in most investors. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg surveillance begins right now on a five-week winning streak on the S&P 500, the longest weekly winning streak going back to May after posting the 45th all-time high of the year so far on the S&P 500. We're at record highs coming into Monday. Your equity market looks like this. We're down by two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we are up, rather, by a quarter of 1%. On a Russell, up by a tenth of 1% as well. The week ahead is absolutely stacked. On the earnings, we'll hear from Bank of America, from Gold, Goldman from City. For the data, look out for retail sales on Thursday. And for the central bank decision, look out for the ECB on the same day. The ECB under a lot of pressure to reduce interest rates in a few days' time. And to give some guidance that they are, have more interest rate cuts that are coming down the pike. A real question for me is how long can we believe in the soft landing, the sort of Goldilocks, or even potentially a no landing with consumers that seem really robust? And that's the reason why retail sales really is the highlight with, uh, to me, along with some of those bank earnings. How much do we get that signal as we have already the consumer is incredibly resilient they're not using up their cash yet and that we're not seeing some sort of imminent recession the united states is looking inwardly in more ways than one we're looking ahead to the election coming up a little bit later in the next month or so europe's looking at china and china's looking at america europe's looking at china for stimulus and china's looking at america to see what the outcome of november actually is on the election front so this is a speculation the reason why we haven't gotten better guidance or more guidance in terms of a headline number as well as efforts to stimulate the uh, consumer appetite in china that they're waiting for some sort of sense of who's going to win the u.s election before understanding what they want to deploy on their end so far we are getting the right words we're getting the right signal but people are not getting the same confidence from china that they can really stimulate consumer demand. And then for Europe, they're struggling with understanding how much increased Chinese demand will actually help their economy because is it going to be domestic consumption for China or external consumption? This was all borne out in the conversation we just had on this program 10 minutes ago with an economist from City. And we ended that conversation with a very simple question. Sound a little bit more confident. Have you upgraded your GDP goal, your target, your forecast for 2025? The answer, no, not yet. Need to see what's going to happen with Chinese authorities and need to wait and find out what happens here in the United States. There is a difference between putting a floor under a potential declines in growth and actually stimulating. And in order to stimulate, you have to have some sort of more uh, holistic sense of what you're looking to do from a policy perspective. And that really goes to the heart of the trade wars that everyone keeps talking about amid the U.S. election. The grind higher in this equity market continues up by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Remember, the bond market is closed stateside for a national holiday. So no Treasury cash trading this morning. Can I just say, why did the bond market get this right and the stock market get this wrong? You mean closing for federal holidays? Yes. I mean, I don't understand this. This was something that was a discussion at home last night where other people in the household didn't understand this. What did you say back? I can't understand it. The bond market's right and the okay. stock market's Are wrong. Are you annoyed because we're at work? <laughs> Is that what this is about? Well, it just seems ridiculous. Like, get on the same page. Why is this always the case? Like the, the stock way. market and the bond market. It's sort of, you know, figure it out. Brown America. Get together. We can't even agree on what's cool today. Exactly. You know, never mind getting the equity market and the bond market to see things the same way. I feel like today is a day of internal division. And I feel like the fact okay. that the bond market it's not is... not what it used to be. Is that what we're calling this? <laughs> this is the day of internal right. division. Okay, it's not the conversation I wanted to have. Coming up this hour, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. As the US bull market turns to Isaac Boltanski of BTIG as the election race Titans and Oshin Kwan of Bank of America on a stock picker's paradise. Look out for that in about 40 minutes' time. We begin this hour with stocks at record highs and earnings season underway on Wall Street. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo saying early third quarter earnings results have been mixed, but investors appear to be cautiously optimistic. Chris joins us around the table. Chris, good morning. Good morning. What's the big takeaway from the early reporters so uh, far? So far, so good. It's, it's too early to make any big predictions, but if you were expecting the wheels to fall off the cart, uh, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. What did you take away from the banks on Friday? Um, it was pretty, pretty good, right? So what, what are we looking at? We're looking at a situation where the Fed's cut 50 basis points. Yes, rates are going a little bit higher, but they're still pretty low. I think it looks like 
GDP for third quarter is going to be around 3% if you follow the Atlanta Fed. And now you're having earnings that are okay. That, that's a recipe for higher stocks, and that's what we're getting. So does this give you a, sort of the feeling that you want to lean in and actually increase your exposure? Mm. Or, I don't know, I was reading your notes and I was wondering, where does this leave you? Because you're basically yeah. saying we're kind of range bound. I don't know. Yeah. Take the rest <laughs> of the year off. Why do I have to keep doing this? Why am I here on a day when the, you know, the bond market's closed? Um, I, I think what it means is you should be more balanced and, and that more companies should par participate. And that's what you're seeing. It's also saying, hey, the economy's okay. Right? If you're talking about recession fears, you probably shouldn't. And your point about people not raising their economic forecast, if you look at the Fed, you look at, at the sell side, they're still talking about 2% until the cows come home. You know, we saw this, we, we saw this uh, earlier this year where people were expecting um, the economy to be in recession. I, I think we came in with 1.3, right? And then what happened in, in the beginning part of the year, we were talking about reflation, 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 where materials, energy, industries all went, traded higher because the economy was better. But it actually wasn't the economy. It was just forecasts being revised up. And I think we might see that. And, and partially, I think that's what's going on right now. People are realizing the economy is stronger, so people should participate, or more economically sensitive companies should begin to participate a little bit more aggressively. So what do you need to see from earnings? Is it really third quarter, or is it some sort of visibility into the future? Is it a sense of confidence that yeah. they can actually make big moves? Because some people are worried that the lack of certainty itself could actually foster some weaker growth ahead just simply because a lot of companies don't want to make big moves. So I don't think we're going to see a ton so far because, as you point out, we have event risk. We have, the, we have the Fed, or we had the Fed. Now we have an election coming up. No one's really going to say anything. What we saw from ISM manufacturing is a lot of people are saying, hey, we will spend. We have the ability to spend. We're, we're not ready to spend. So while you may want, we're looking for better guidance, but we're just not, probably not going to get it because people aren't ready. They're not sure who's president. There's a lot of event risk. And so really what we fall back on is how are fundamentals right now? The fundamentals right now, not bad. Mike Wilson spoke to some of this from Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Similar theme in the last week on this program. He said investors have just attached themselves to themes. GLP-1s, yeah. AI, utilities exploded yeah. through 2024. Yeah. Come off the ball a little bit on that front. Right. What's the theme that you want to really grab hold of yeah. right now? Uh, you, you know, we're, we're struggling with that. We're looking more of a trade. You know, what we do think is you're broadening out. We think you got a good shot at, at small caps ending the year on a really high note. But the theme is really more about um, producers and then consumers at this point in time. I think 2025, you're really going to want to dig into industrials and cyclicals because we are seeing that dynamic between price and unit volume beginning to inflect. And that's really positive for earnings on, on the industrial side. Just elaborate a little bit. So you think that producers right. and the consumers should be the ones that benefit yeah. the most? Uh, no, I, I think the consumer's fine, as you were alluding to before, the consumer's fine. Our issue on the consumer is as long as you know the consumer has capacity, they will spend, and they still do have capacity. But do we really want to lean on that? No, we really don't want to lean on that. Where we want to lean into is we want to lean into these mega projects. We want to lean into that secular story around electrification. And oh, by the way, what we're seeing for just general industrial companies is that unit volume price mix is starting to per turn positive. They've held on to price, held on to price, and now unit volume is starting to turn up. And that's a really interesting dynamic for 2025. You talked about the election. We were speaking with Lori Calvacina of RBC earlier this morning, and she was saying that a lot of people are also waiting to see what happens yeah. with the election. And then John asked her, what are they waiting for? What are they going to do with either candidate? And she said, they just want to have an answer <laughs> so that they can move on. Is that basically what you've seen, too? The, the, they want certainty. And then there's just two different betas. And, and I think the stock market will react positively, but you're going to have a very different reaction from a Trump win versus a Harris win. I think under a Harris win, it's going to be very growthy longer term, right? The, the model you should take, take forth is what happened under Obama and Biden. If Trump wins, at least for the first three to six months, it's going to be value, it's going to be banks, and it's going to be small caps. So really, while people are just waiting for a result and, and the market probably trades higher because they get certainty, very different reaction function. Are you confident we even get a result that week? Pretty confident, but I can't, I can't guarantee, right? The other thing is, if you go back when we had the hanging chads, that was something that we probably won't focus on this, fo this time forward. What it'll be is things will be too close and you'll have to have an automatic recount, automatic recount, which won't, that doesn't go to the Supreme Court. How do you think the market's going to trade that story? Uh, not well. I mean, initially you'll see some negativity, but I, I don't think it's going to last very long. So as soon as they get it resolved, um, we're, we're back up.
I can tell how excited everybody is. I don't think we're going to have hanging chads. We'll just have other issues. I mean, that's basically what everyone's talking about. You asked the right question. If we don't have an answer at a certain point, how do markets handle that? And are people basically lining up to buy that volatility because yeah. they assume that essentially there will be some sort of certainty? I don't think yeah. anyone knows what to do with this election. I think they got it wrong in 2016. They thought ultimately that Donald Trump would be a risk-off candidate for markets. They learned pretty quickly that morning that he wouldn't be. This time around, I think we've all got these scenarios and no one knows what to do. I feel like there's an element of burying our heads in the sand just a little bit. Mm -hmm. that the reality is the base case, if you ask actual people who are following this election really closely, who aren't in markets, who are just charged with trying to understand how this is going to play out, they'll tell you their base case is you won't get an answer the morning after the election, that this could take days and maybe even weeks. I don't think the market's on that page at all, Chris. That's not what I yeah. hear from market participants. Well, what I would add to that is it's geopolitical is pretty hot right now. Okay, if we don't have a president, that geopolitical probably gets hotter real fast. And then we have a lame, lame duck president. Whoever wins, right, doesn't come into office until next year. You have people who we have situations across the globe that could heat up very, very quickly. And, and when people people may want to challenge that and say, hey, I see an opportunity and that could cause a lot of volatility. With that in mind, do you look into Asia or to the Middle East? Um, both uh, Asia, Middle East. It, it's really. You know, if you, you look across the globe, one of the things we think about it is they're going to challenge the new regime, whichever regime that that is, right? Things are as hot as I've seen in on the geopolitical side in a long time. And, and that's my big, like when people saying everyone's feeling pretty confident, everyone's feeling, okay, things are good. But the big concern, the big risk is what happens on the geopolitical front, either if we don't have a president or the fact that we have a lame duck president and the new president really can't do much until he or she is, is, is put into office. Just to put a line under that, how much then is the hedge to buy oil companies rather than, say, treasuries yeah. or treasury-like exposures? Yeah, I, I think the hedge is more on the commodity than, than the stocks, and, and you've obviously seen the, the commodity do pretty well. Um, the stocks we're not big fans of, and I'm not sure you're going to get the right reaction. So the commodity seems more, more sensitive and, and, and likely the better hedge at, at this juncture. Chris, it's good to see you. Good to Appreciate see you your too. time, buddy. Thank you. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Equities right now on the S&P up by a little more than a tenth of 1% with an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Goldman Sachs has upgraded its forecast for China's economic growth in 2024 and 25, spurred by Beijing's announcement of a series of measures to shore up growth, including plans for greater public spending. The bank expects China GDP to expand 4.9% this year. They did see it at 4.7 previously. It also lifted its growth prediction for the following year to 4.7 from 4.3 percent. Taiwan Semiconductor is expanding its global footprint and eyeing Europe for its next chip making plants. A senior Taiwanese official said that construction is underway in a facility in Dresden, Germany, but speculation that another plant could soon be announced in the Czech Republic. TSMC has spent billions in recent years to develop plants in allied countries like the U.S., Japan and Germany, with risks looming over tensions with China. The Harris campaign is trying to draw attention to the health of the candidates. Harris released a detailed medical record that claims the vice president is in excellent health with data on her blood pressure, diet and lifestyle. Harris challenged Trump to release his medical records, which he has cooperated in his prior presidential campaigns. Trump told CBS he'd gladly release the records, but so far has declined requests to do so. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes. Up next on the program, Trump and Harris, neck and neck. She's so bad. She's so bad. It can't happen. Although the way things go in this country nowadays, I guess it probably could. One must question, are they afraid that people will see that he is too weak and unstable? <laughs> You still have a few more weeks left of this. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity's a little bit firmer, up by a tenth of 1% on the S&P and change. In the FX market, the euro a little bit weaker. We're down a tenth of 1%. Look out for the ECB decision this Thursday. Under surveillance this morning, Trump and Harris, neck and neck. She's so bad. She's so bad. It can't happen. Although the way things go in this country nowadays, I guess it probably could. 
That's why we want to build up a lead. He's not being transparent, so check this out. He refuses to release his medical records. One must question, are they afraid that people will see that he is too weak and unstable to lead America? So here's the latest this morning. Trump and Harris campaigns narrowing in on swing state voters as time runs out ahead of election day. The candidates are deadlocked in the latest NBC polling as Harris reportedly sees fizzling momentum. Isa Boltanski of BTIG saying there are concerning data points for the Harris campaign. In particular, we continue to highlight that Trump meaningfully outperforms Harris on the top two issues for voters, the economy and immigration. Isaac joins us now for more. Isaac, welcome back to the programme, sir. It's good to see you. Do you still have Trump as a slight favourite? And give us more detail on why. You know, with the caveat, John, that no one knows anything, right? And, and we're all just applying our mental models and we're doing our best to read the tea leaves. But no one can have the utmost confidence in polling, given how terrible it was during the last cycle. I think what, what I've tried to do is focus in on one mental framework for this election, and it's what do swing state voters care about? And in every single poll, they list the economy and immigration as their number one and number two issues. Trump has maintained his lead on both of those issues since the beginning of the election. Um, it's a relatively healthy margin on both of those issues in the swing states. And that's my mental model, with the caveat that no one really knows what we need when we get into election day. Isaac, it's a major caveat that no one knows anything, but I'll run with that caveat. No one knows anything. One exercise people were doing over the weekend, and I saw this repeatedly, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, they were comparing where the former president was in previous polls in 2016 and 2020 in swing states, and then how he performed in reality when the actual vote came around. And what you saw was just outperformance after outperformance, Isaac, and they're looking at these swing state polls and suggesting that maybe we get that outperformance again. How valuable is that exercise, considering that we've done this now for three times? You know, look, I, in talking to pollsters, which we spend a fair amount of time doing, the, the pollsters believe that they have solved some of their issues from 2020 by focusing on, on voters who have actually voted. Um, and we're going to see if that has an impact. But, but John, I, I look at the quote unquote blue wall states of Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. In 2020, Trump outperformed the polls in those states by five to six and a half points, given that he's in a dead heat of a percent or so in each of those three states against Vice President Harris. You have to have a, a, at least a, a modicum of a sense that. Um, the Trump campaign might outperform those numbers again, at which point uh, we're not in the margin of error like it seemed for the past few weeks. One of the big question marks is whether pollsters have actually adjusted to what happened in the past two elections. I mean, have they communicated that they've tried to adjust for uh, this discrepancy or are we probably doing a repeat? Look, I, I think that structurally you can get a degree of, of comfort that they're changing things. But the fact here is we still don't have the methods and the means to get a good read of, of sentiment. Uh, this is not 45 years ago where you could just dial folks up on the phone. I also think that we've got to keep in mind there is undeniably a quote unquote shy Trump voter. That's something in, in uh, polling that you hear referred to as the Bradley effect, where folks just won't tell you their viewpoint when they're on the phone. Um, I think that those things are, are really things you can't solve for now. And so I generally think of polls as giving us some indication directionally of where we're going, but we can't look at them for any degree of this. Isaac, you said that nobody knows anything. We'll go with that. A big question is also composition of Congress. And you put out these figures in your latest note that I thought was fascinating, that you believe that Republicans have about a 75 percent chance of winning the control of the Senate and a 55 percent chance of retaining control over the House. Basically, put this all together, we're looking at a much greater likelihood of a red sweep than what is currently being priced in or figured by most people out there. How do you sort of talk to your clients about that? Yeah, look, there are two, there are two points that we try to make. Number one, on the presidential election, there are certain themes that you can sink your teeth into that I think are going to occur no matter who wins. Right. One is we're going to continue deficit finance spending no matter who wins. That's a theme on that end. But in terms of uh, looking at D.C. And, and the different permutations, I have utmost confidence that the Senate is going to flip to Republican control. And here it's about geography and arithmetic. 
Um, in terms of geography, Democrats are defending really, really tough seats in Ohio and Montana. In terms of arithmetic, they would have to run the table on all of these just to have a shot at, at maintaining the upper chamber. So in an election when no one knows anything, and we have to have a decent amount of humility regarding that, the one thing that I can anchor myself to when I try to think about the, the uh, post-24 election landscape is, I think we're going to have a Republican Senate, which has real implications for oversight of regulators and ultimately the fiscal fights that are going to dominate 2025. Isaac, I, know, I have no idea if you've done this exercise, but I'd be curious if someone did. On the campaign trail last week, there was a very important accusation by the former President Bar Barack Obama that black males might not be ready to vote for Kamala Harris because she's a woman. It's quite a statement and a very tricky road to go down because basically what you're telling a large group of people is this has nothing to do with policy. Basically, he's accusing people of being misogynistic. Now, Isaac, I want to understand from your perspective, and I'd love someone to do this exercise if you haven't, could you tell me how certain races are performing relative to the top of the ticket? And if there's any evidence whatsoever that someone who's willing to vote Democrat isn't willing to vote for her because she's a woman? Look, this is part of the problem with the landscape is that we, we're never going to know what someone does when they go into a polling booth and, and they pull that curtain behind them, right? We don't know what's going to motivate them at the, at the very last second. So that's part of the reason that I've tried to focus on state level data about, you know, what actually motivates uh, some of these voters. And again, it's the economy and immigration. But John, I can't tell you if if they're going to go into that voting booth and say, today, I'm not as worried about the economy. Today, I care about health care choice. Right. At which point you have a complete different um, uh, outcome. And so to me, I, I don't think there is an answer to that. I think that's why you're seeing such targeted ads over the past few weeks is that the campaigns themselves have been able to, to hone in on some of these messages that they think are going to motivate very specific groups of voters. But I, I don't think there is an answer for that yet. On a larger level, what is the reason for this huge gap in gender? Because that's really one of the themes that we've seen in this election, just the difference between men and women. Yeah, look, there's always been a gender gap, right? I mean, if, if only men voted, I, I don't know if there would be a Democratic Party uh, anymore at this point. So uh, there's always been a gender gap. But I think what you're seeing is a more pronounced gender gap that is, A, um, localized in people of color and black and Latino voters. I think that that surprised the Harris campaign. And B, that it's been somewhat persistent. I mean, the, the Harris campaign has done a pronounced... Uh, effort in getting out to male voters on certain issues. And so uh, I think that they've been surprised, A, of the gap, and B, of the persistency there. So look, I think part of that uh, you can absolutely ascribe to some uh, structural misogyny. Sure. I think that's something that you're seeing from the, the Harris campaign highlighting it. But but I have, again, enough humility here to, to know that I don't know what motivates every voter. It's just something that when you dig into the numbers, it's there. And it's something that I think is becoming one of the defining themes of this cycle. And Isaac, just quickly, wasn't it there before Harris? Wasn't it there when Biden was top of the ticket? Yeah, look, I think that this is this is one of the reasons that you could see the coalescing around Biden in the primary. Um, so look, this is this is a structural dynamic that, that's at play and one that I don't think is just about this election. I think it's a bigger one that, that we're probably going to have to have many, many conversations about to try to understand. But we're 21 days out here, and we're going to see if this is one of the, the singular themes that moves the election or if it's something else. Certainly a big theme right now. Isaac, appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Isaac Botansky there of BTIG. It's becoming a bigger and bigger issue on a campaign trail. Did you hear what he said, that if only men were voting, then there wouldn't be a Democratic Party? I mean, basically, this gap has gotten incredibly wide, and we need to have a lot of conversations about of why course. it exists. It's never any one reason. There is always going to be many, but one, and they're not willing to discuss it, the left has been demonizing men for a long, long time. And for other males, they feel like that's no longer a party for them. And I think you see that in the polls. Well, and we'll see whether people turn out. And that will ultimately come down to uh, who wins. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Stocks are firmer across the board here on the S&P 500, up around about a tenth. Similar move on the Nasdaq. Likewise on a Russell, up by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, up by two tenths of 1%, following five consecutive weeks of gains on both the S&P and the Nasdaq 100. If you turn the page and get to foreign exchange, let's take a look at the euro and take a look at pound sterling. Cable, 
130.46, the pound just a little bit weaker on the session, going into an important conversation later on this morning, two hours away. Keir Starmer, the British Prime Minister, sitting down with Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders. The outlook for the economy in the United Kingdom. And Lisa, ultimately, what's going to happen with the budget in a few weeks' time? Especially after some pretty dire comments we've heard from Keir Starmer. Uh, sort of this question of how much did he come out with a sense of being sort of practical, budget uh, being balanced kind of type of candidate. And then when he actually is putting it into policy, it's looking a little bit different and giving a whole bunch of different constituents some anxiety. It's been a tough 100 days, hasn't it? It has. It hasn't been great at all. Their approach to the economy, to the deficit and to financial markets, it's like a document that was written for the immediate aftermath of Liz Truss and they never edited it. When things settled down in financial markets, when the economy started to improve, it just feels like they're looking at a rearview mirror to a different place. It looks like there's an emphasis on reducing debt rather than juicing growth. And at a certain time, when companies are looking for some confidence that the policies are in place for them to feel comfortable expanding in London, expanding in the UK, they're not getting that in any kind of practice from this administration. That effort starts this morning. There's a summit where they're gathering business leaders. If you're familiar with the one that Emmanuel Macron leads over in Paris, France earlier on this year in May, it's kind of like that. All the CEOs coming together. Francine's been speaking to a few of them already this morning. Morning. That emphasis is shifting back to growth, but it's taken a number of months to get there. As you said, a messy 100 days as they try to figure out their footing and how much input are they going to actually get from these companies and how much are they going to listen. As you heard that warning from some of the big bankers, if you don't make these changes, you will permanently lose your stature as a major global financial center. Let's turn to the commodity market. Brent crude WTI trading softer, lower by more than two percentage points. A headline that just crossed the Bloomberg terminal five, six minutes ago from OPEC cutting their global oil demand growth court forecast for a third straight month. And what this really comes down to when you look at some of the details is just adjusting to the actual demand that they see on the ground. They also have some forecasts for U.S. and European uh, economic growth. In the U.S., they're talking about upgrading the forecast uh, for this year to 2.5 percent from 2.4 percent. Next year, keeping it around 1.9 percent. Get this for the economic growth forecast for this year, 0.8 percent. This is not an area that is growing, and that is currently what we're seeing in Germany. How much does that color the sphere versus just simply this idea that people are transferring to other types of uh, energy output? Quite a tug of war, isn't it, Lisa, right now? The risk of a supply shock and oil prices surging, and on the other side, the risk of softer demand captured by this OPEC report this morning. I can't help but be a little bit cynical, and I wonder if this lays the groundwork for them to prolong some of the cuts to supply so that they can get prices to go higher, but that's just me. I don't know if that's cynical. I think that's rather intuitive after I mean, what we've heard from them. If you just think about it, it doesn't really seem like they're cutting growth forecasts. It doesn't seem like there's any other reason. So if they're cutting their demand growth forecast for the third straight month at a time where they're trying to prop up prices and potentially going to keep some of the production cuts in place, well, you put those two things together and this makes sense. That's the latest from OPEC this morning and from Lisa on the crude market. <laughs> Under surveillance this morning. Speculation. The U.S. is sending an advanced missile defense system to Israel to help shield it from further attacks from Iran. The terminal high-altitude area defense will support Israel's own air defenses, which were stretched by Iranian attacks at least twice already so far this year. And as you said, Lisa, I think you're right. We're preparing not for the retaliation from Israel to Iran, but to potentially the like for like coming back from Iran, if that's what we're going to see. Which is the reason why Halima Croft said, look at any people who are selling crude in a relief sort of sale as uh, being a bit premature, because ultimately it is the tit for tat and how much this escalation does continue. And ultimately, there is clearly an effort to prepare for an escalation on both sides. Gone into the last few weekends waiting for that retaliation and still waiting this Monday morning. A turn to this story, President Biden announcing $612 million in recovery aid for areas damaged by hurricanes Milton and Helene. The White House saying funds will go towards six Department of Energy projects to strengthen the region's electricity grid. That's been a big focus for us over the last few days. And just the fact that the maps that they had for the potential destruction of these two storms, which are very different in nature and the ways that they were destructive, were totally outdated. The U.S. flood maps were drawn up in the 70s and 80s. They were not drawn up in the current climate. And that, I think, people are looking at also to understand what they need to do to fortify 
some of the infrastructure to get it prepared for more of the same. Asheville, North Carolina wasn't something that everyone talked about with regards to floods. People didn't think that that region was going to be as susceptible. They also, how do you prepare for such different types of threats? On one hand, you had just a deluge of rain and flooding from the mountains. And on the other hand, you had wind that was coming in at catastrophic, catastrophic speeds. The rebuild effort starts right now in a big way. Let's talk about big bank earnings. They continue with Goldman City, Bank of America tomorrow, Morgan Stanley on Wednesday. The company is expected to see rising revenue pressures and lower net interest income as the Fed cuts rates. All of these banks have been lowering the bar through conference season going into the results. Goldman Sachs were talking about softer trading revenue. Net interest income was the focus for JP Morgan. Ally Financial were warning about credit. Then what happened on Friday? JP Morgan, Wells Fargo both come out and basically say there's nothing to see here. Just to be very clear, Jamie Diamond was very aggravated when people were asking him about net interest income, basically saying it's a stupid metric. Basically, you guys are trying to put this into a model and it comes out one way or another. Bottom line is they're doing really well. The consumer isn't cracking. There are a lot of risks on the table and they don't have a lot of certainty going forward. Wells Fargo saying the same thing, that they're looking for some sign of a softening consumer, not seeing it. So this sort of goes to where you are now versus you will where you will be. And where you will be is a big black box that nobody really knows. Bank stocks. Amidst all of that, having a really decent week again just last week on the S&P 500. On top of bank earnings, investors also keeping one eye on more Fed speak and data, including retail sales. Neela Richardson of ADP calling it the most important data point of the week, noting two things. September's report tends to be softer with consumers prepping for holiday spending, but a sharper than expected decline could signal broader weakness. Nita joins us now for more. Nita, good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning. Let's go ro run with that word, weakness. And let's think about jobless claims last week on Thursday. They gapped out. They spiked higher. Can we start there? What's behind that? Is that all just hurricane related? That's what we don't know. And that's what this period is going to be very messy and hard to interpret. So the hurricanes usually have a very temporary effect on the economy. As we've seen, there's going to be a rebuilding effort. So we might see a little bit of slip in growth in the last three quarters of the year, followed by a rebound in 2025. But what's going to be more immediate is the effect on the labor market. It first is going to come with hours worked. M remember in September, most of the jobs that were created like a bulk of them, two thirds in the private sector, were jobs that you have to be on site for. So retail, healthcare. If you look at the damage across the Southeast and the, the number of businesses that are still without electricity, going to work is going to be a challenge. And so that's what I expect to see, that hours worked really playing a role. And that, those hours are not just hours alone. They're going to feed into our measures of productivity, our measures of hourly earnings. And so I, I think that the October jobs report is going to be really, really clouded. It makes me wonder if I'm on the Federal Reserve sitting there November 7th and hopefully we've got an election result in hand and they're looking at these numbers, what will they get a clean read on, if anything at all? They might get a clean read on retail sales um, because that's probably not going to be as affected in the September data as the jobs market. And they're going to be really focused on the health of the consumer in terms of uh, whether they might need to make an aggressive cut or not. Um, if the consumer stays relatively balanced, which they've proven to be very resilient through the summer, um, then I don't think they're going to need to do anything drastic when it comes to worries about the state of the economy. Do you feel like there is some sort of weakness or do you think in the data that you see at ADP, it's just simply companies that are reluctant to make a big move, sort of becomes a self-fulfilling cycle mm -hmm. of not having confidence to hire and so then that doesn't get back into the economy so it just sort of chugs along at this very yeah. low rate. We we saw hesitancy over the summer. There did seem to be this feeling that companies were holding back a little bit and not because of economic weakness. Just that there's a lot of uncertainty and that uncertainty can lead you to delay decision making. Well, a part of that uncertainty was kind of corrected when the Fed started uh, their rate cutting cycle. We knew now that we were on the path to lower interest rates and it seemed to saw some of that hesitancy and we saw a big jump in hiring in September. Now, what happens in October, I don't know because the uncertainty has returned in a different form with the hurricanes and where most of the, the jobs we're seeing is with service providers. We don't know how uh, global or national companies are going to be looking at the hurricane damage in the Southeast and maybe 
you know, fine-tuning their hiring plans even more. Just to put together what you were saying, the idea that retail sales is possibly going to be even more important than some of the uh, employment data simply because that's going to be so distorted for the Federal Reserve. Is there a feeling that retail sales could drive business decisions? Because essentially, if you don't make a decision to lean into this kind of strength, that's on you and that companies eventually will have to realize that. Right. These next three months for retailers are hugely important. They make about 20 to 25 percent of their revenue over the holiday season. And so, that yes, in some sense, they're going to have to skip over any kind of hesitancy and lean into what we're seeing so far, which is consumer strength. And you want to play into that, especially if a big share of your revenues for the year are going to be in the next three months. So I, I do expect some hiring, but I also expect some caution in certain regions. And so we'll see how that plays out over the next three months. You expect some hiring. It's the absence of firing that stood out for us all. Yeah. And then we just see this big contradiction on Thursday with jobless claims spiking. Where are we on layoffs? How do you view things? Because the job openings data that we get, it's a little bit dated. You get a real-time look at things at ADP. Where are we with hirings and firings, more particularly? Well, the trend overall, and we have to always look at the trend and not just a single data point, especially when we know that that data point could have been affected by weather events. But the trend overall is people are staying on the jobs longer. Um, and that's both voluntary quits and involuntary layoffs. So there hasn't been a lot of moves in terms of the overall headcount. And the hiring we've seen has been expansive hiring, not replacement hiring. So that's good news. Now, there are some sectors that we've seen some downturns in manufacturing and in information. Uh, but overall, in terms of the service industry, it's been really, really strong. The Federal Reserve has a bias to cut interest rates at the moment. Rafael Bostic, who's going to be a key policymaker in the month to come, particularly with the hurricane damage across his region, mm -hmm. suggested skipping a meeting. How do you feel about skipping a meeting, given all the contradictions in the data, the murkiness? Why should the buy still be to reduce rates? Well, about three months ago, I actually said this, that it's going to be likely that there would be stops and starts in monetary policy, that they would not be on a smooth glide path because of all of the uncertainties in the economy. Yes, the economy is strong, but every, every month you get a new narrative about the future direction. And I think the Fed is very susceptible to that. And these weather-related events don't make it any easier. So yes, I do think that that is a real possibility that they may skip meetings in order to figure out what's going on in the economy. And that is related to their strategy, which is to be data dependent. Maybe it's time for a, different, a rethink on that strategy to be a little bit more long term. I feel like we're kind of playing hopscotch with data. We just hop and leap from one data point to the next. I don't think that's a, a really viable strategy that you want to see with the Fed long term. The ECB is not playing hopscotch. They've got a pretty clear message and they meet on Thursday. How much can we conclude this period of time that the U.S. has truly diverged from Europe when it comes to economic trends? Well, that divergence has been in play for all year, right? So the labor market is strong to be candid. I mean, there's some parts of Europe that are doing much better than expected, like the UK, for example, which was um, thought to be going into recession a year ago, and they, they made it through that period. Um, they're still going to see the same kind of labor market tightness that we see in the United States. Those are long-term demographic effects. But when it comes to the US economic story, it is unique and separate and apart from any other place in the world right now. You see a, a healthy consumer, you see strong business investment, you see a stock market that keeps growing, and you see a very strong labor market. So all those things added together put some distance with the rest of the world, and it's really the U.S. that is driving the world economy right now. How much, when we're talking about China, the fact that there's sort of this deflation and there's a sense that growth is really falling off a cliff, how much do you see that not at all affecting the U.S., that these two economies have really grown apart, even though we are seeing it trickle into Europe in a much more meaningful way? It's interesting, the U.S. economy, because we think of it as a global economy. But there's parts of the U.S. economy that is insulated from global effects, our energy, for example. Um, and so, yes, I do think that China being the second largest economy in the world will eventually affect the United States. But how much is undeterminate? I do think that there's still some tailwinds in the U.S. economy that even allow us to grow past weakness other places. Neela, you're one of the best. It's good to catch up. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Neela Richardson of ADP, trying to look beyond 2024 and get into 2025, the range of outcomes for 25. And of course, there are different probabilities attached to different outcomes. But November in the election, you could have tax rate at 28 percent, 
tax rate for corporate taxes of 15% with conditions. We might have tons of tariffs. We might have none. We might have what we're left with. I've got no idea. That's the next 12 months. Yeah, and then add to that what Chris Harvey was talking about, that when you get a lame duck president at a time where some of the hot war risks in the global economy are raging, how much uncertainty does that add into the picture? Basically, all of this should make you want to hide under a pillow, but people are still buying stocks, and that's what we see today. Not just buying stocks, buying credit too. Credit spreads, exactly. Lisa, your world, they are so, so tight for high yield and investment grade. If you're looking for some sort of forward indicator that we're going to see uh, defaults or any kind of stress in the credit worlds, the canary in the coal mine, you ain't seeing it. So this sort of raises this question of if you're going to get that weakness, where is it flashing? Because it's not flashing in VIX. It's not flashing in credit. It's not flashing in stocks. It's not flashing in earnings. And it's not flashing with the consumer. Where could it be? Very close to multi-decade tights across certain parts of this credit market right now. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Authorities arrested a man on gun charges outside former President Trump's Coachella rally over the weekend. The 49-year-old suspect was driving with a fake license plate and IDs with different names. Federal officials said the former president was not in danger and the investigation is ongoing. Marine Le Pen is heading to court. France's far-right leader is appearing before judges today. Her and her party are standing trial over suspected embezzlement of European parliamentary funds. The National Rally Party and 25 of its top officials went on trial last month for having used money intended for EU parliamentary aids and instead paid staff who worked for the party between 2004 and 2016. Le Pen has denied any wrongdoing. A new Bloomberg survey found that Germany is going through a mild recession. It underscores the months of unease in Europe's largest economy. Analysts in that poll see GDP shrinking 0.1% in the third quarter. That follows the unexpected contraction of the same size in the second quarter. The weakness in Germany is largely tied to the cutoff of Russian energy supplies, disappointing export demand from China, problems among car makers, and a scarcity of skilled workers. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Up next, a stock picker's paradise. People might say they're bearish, but when you look at the positioning and look at their equity exposure, it's still relatively high. Earnings need to do a lot more heavy lifting as we turn the corner into 25. The View from Bank of America, just around the corner, live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Five weeks of gains on the S&P 500, the longest weekly winning streak going back to May of this year, looking to add some weight to the rally up by, let's call it two-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. A lot to work through this week, bank earnings, some economic data, retail sales, the main event, that drops on Thursday morning. Under surveillance this morning, a stock picker's paradise. People might say they're bearish, but when you look at the positioning and look at their equity exposure, it's still relatively high. Household stock exposure, depending on which metric you use, is, is right around, right near an all-time high. There's not as much juice to squeeze out of that valuation or the multiple expansion uh, part of this market, so I think earnings need to do a lot more heavy lifting as we turn the corner into 25. So here's the latest. Earnings season resuming this week with big banks once again at the top of the schedule. Bank of America expecting it to be a great environment for active investors. Usun Kwan of Bank of America writing the real action is going to be at the single stock level this earnings season. It's a stock picker's paradise as long as companies have managed through macro headwinds and see early signs of improvement from lower rates. We believe stocks would get rewarded. Usun joins us now for more. Good morning. Good to see you. Thanks, Let's start with that. Why is this a stock picker's paradise? Give us some detail. Yeah, so if you look at the single stock level, what the options market is pricing in, it's pricing in the biggest implied move or biggest earnings reaction in our data history going back to 2021. If you look at the implied vol at the index level for the S&P 500, it's still very, very low, which means that the real action is going to be at the single stock level, not necessarily at the index level. And that's basically a very good environment for stock pickers. Just to break that down, does that also mean the real action is away from the big tech names? Is that fair to say? It, it might be, yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think big tech is still going to be a big focus this earnings season. But I think the real focus isn't necessarily about what how companies did in Q3. It's really about what... The, 
it's about the outlook on the other side of the curve now that an easing cycle has begun. And I think the most interesting companies to watch for is really the race sensitive sectors of the economy. So ma namely manufacturing, housing, even financials. I think those areas are going to be the biggest focus this earnings season. You, you had this statistic, which I found rather shocking, that in the third quarter, you saw 67% of stocks outperforming the S&P 500. This speaks to a broadening out that we haven't seen going back to 2002. Just put into perspective what the characteristic of those stocks were that did outperform, considering that they were two-thirds of the entire overall 500. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is what happens when the market is so concentrated in those market names. And I think if you think about the internal market rotation over the past two years, I think it was really driven by earnings. A lot of people say rates was the biggest driver or even inflation. But if you think about heading into 22, everyone was worried about the Fed hiking cycle and what that's going to do to long duration equities. And people say that's why tech underperformed in 22. But if that was the case, tech should have underperformed last year as well. I think it was really about earnings. Tech earnings underperformed S&P 500 earnings the entire year in 22. And it bottomed in March of 23. And that's essentially when tech earnings bought, uh, or tech stopped underperforming and started to outperform. And the other 493 just came out of an earnings recession in Q2, and their earnings are expected to accelerate, re-accelerate in Q4 and into 2025. And I think the narrowing uh, growth differential between tech and others' earnings, I think that's really the main driver of the rotation that we started seeing. So does this mean that essentially tech earnings are now set to underperform, underdeliver, not beat as much, and essentially could be laggards even as the others lead? In other words, a lot of churn under the surface even if the index number stays the same. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they're necessarily going to miss. Um, I mean, these are basically fundamentally the best companies in the world. So I think they're still going to deliver, but there's also high expectations that they are going to deliver that, because they have been delivering and valuations are high. Positioning is elevated. So if you look at posi positioning and valuations in the other 493, it's still very low. There's a big gap between the other 493 and, and the MAX7. So I think that's really going to Cost, uh, drive the catalyst, especially as earnings broaden out. Let's focus on 2025. A theme for this program for months is that we're flying blind into 25 until we know the outcome of the election. A lot of people come on the program and say low visibility, still don't really know what policy is going to look like. How much visibility do you have and where are you getting it from? Where does any confidence or conviction come from for one year out? Yeah, I want to say we have higher visibility than a lot of people do. And the reason why I say that is because the, the manufacturing and the most race sensitive sectors of the economy have been in a recession over the past two years. I mean, a lot of people are saying that um, this hiking cycle didn't really have an impact on the overall economy, which is true. GDP is 70% services, 70% consumption. But if you look at underneath the surface, manufacturing and housing, race sensitive sectors, they have been in a recession. And that matters for earnings and equities because 50% of earnings for the S&P are tied to manufacturing goods. So that's why we haven't really seen you know, great environment for profits. Volume is still very low. And I don't think 2025 estimates are that high. I mean, everyone's talking about how it's overly optimistic, 15% growth uh, that consensus is pricing in. I think it's, it might be a touch too high. We're at 13%. Um, if you look at volume expectations for next year, excluding the max seven, consensus is forecasting about 2.5% volume growth. And that's not too high, especially compared to super easy comp that we're expecting this year, which is up like 0.5% year over year. So I don't think it's necessarily overly optimistic. I, I think it's just might be touched too high. Awesome. This was smart. It's good to see you. Come back soon. Awesome Kwon there of Bank of America on earnings season and looking ahead to 2025. Coming up on this program, Kate Moore of BlackRock, Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares will catch up with Sonia Meskin of UBS and Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark Global Investments. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. The market has been trying to push in too much policy accommodation. You do need to see earnings estimates continue to rise, we think, in order to support the market. We're expecting that the S&P can maintain a higher than traditional valuation setup premised on much more resilient fundamentals than many would have thought. Investors probably have to link the time horizons. It's just not as beneficial anymore to be as near-term focused. I don't think after 
a bull market, so to speak, in both equity and credit that has lasted this long has not sucked in most investors. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Happy anniversary to the American bull market. We had some weight to it. Equity futures on the S&P 500, firmer by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. That's my romance for the morning. Yeah, that was such, that such romance, man. I'm blown away. All-time highs at a close <laughs> on Friday. We add some to that move this morning. Just a tenth on the S&P, up three tenths on the Nasdaq 100. I can do better. Yeah, Anna Russell, up by 0.04. The week ahead looks like this. Lots of bank earnings. We get some more tomorrow morning. You'll hear from Bank of America and Goldman. And lots of data, including retail sales on Thursday and an ECB rate decision. Retail sales, the data point of the week for a lot of people. Neil F. Richardson actually saying it might be more important for the Federal Reserve than the jobs figure that comes out next month, just simply because it will be so messy that it won't give any clarity. What will be less messy will be the fact that one thing you cannot get between is an American and their credit card. And that is essentially what we've been hearing about and seeing in all of the data and all of the rhetoric coming out of companies. The data is already messy. I think we're still trying to figure out that jobless claims figure on Thursday. Big gap higher, much, much higher than anticipated. The wrong kind of upside surprise. How much of that was just the hurricane impact? And how much of it wasn't? Honestly, Basically, there's no sign of real mass firing. So a lot of people say, look, it is messy because of the hurricane. That said, you're not seeing a lot of mass hiring either. So if you have the stagnation, which way is it going to flip? Do you see a flip in the market expectations? I know the bond market's closed today because they've got their priorities straight about having a day off, uh, but the stock market does not. Either way, 10-year uh, Treasury yields have risen 45 basis points since the low about a month ago, less than a month ago in uh, September. That is a 41% retracement of this year's rally. So all the people who are talking about the Fed not needing to really worry too much about inflation, they could cut aggressively, that's kind of gone off the table in less than a month. You're writing letters to the stock exchange. I am. I think okay. that it's ridiculous. Let us know if they respond. Okay. Coming up this hour, Kate Moore of BlackRock as the bull market marks its second anniversary. Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares as the automaker shuffles its C-suite and Sonia Meskin of UBS looking ahead to retail sales. We begin this hour with stocks hitting all-time highs as the S&P 500 celebrates its second anniversary over the weekend. Kate Moore of BlackRock is looking ahead to earnings. Even with our balanced optimism about 3Q results, we are more focused on how management guides for 4Q and into 2025. We want to hear management teams express confidence about their ability to deliver revenue growth, to manage expenses, and to navigate policy and political uncertainty. Three very different themes. Mm. Kate joins us now for more. Kate, good morning. It's good to see you. Don, I'm a little sad. I didn't realize I was coming here on the anniversary of the bull market. I would have dressed differently. How should we have dressed? Like with red ties and hearts and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, Thank maybe you. a tiara. I mean, it's quite a celebration. In fact, <laughs> and, and I feel really good about the fact that equities continue to make new all-time highs and that the fundamentals look really solid this far into the cycle. Let's start with top-line revenue growth. Mm. Where's it coming from? How much confidence do you have that we'll get more of that through 25? Well, this was the big question, right, as we went through second quarter reporting, where, you know, companies were putting up good bottom line numbers, but the top line was really disappointing on expectations. This kind of quarter, we've seen a, a bunch of solid activity. We've seen good incomes. We've been, you know, encouraged by the fact that inflation has continued to slow. Uh, and I think we're going to see solid but not blockbuster revenue growth in the third quarter. The real chance is going to be if we get into next year and some of the uncertainty is removed. I think people will feel more comfortable about increasing their activity. I mean, by people, I mean, both business decision makers and individuals. One of the reasons why maybe you didn't realize it was a second anniversary and John didn't sound overly enthusiastic about it, although happy anniversary. I do you think it hasn't felt this way? Right. It has not felt like That's a bull right. market. It has felt like a grind of lots of different narratives that are coming together with whipsaws in between and a couple of behemoths that have absolutely led the charge while everything else had a soggy performance. When will it start to feel like a bull market? Well, you're right. There's been a huge amount of discomfort in the leadership and the strength of that leadership, the persistence of the leadership. A message that we've talked about many times, and I feel like I have been a broken record, is to say the companies that have been leading the market are the strongest fundamentally. These are the companies putting up the cash flow. And I expect that will continue into 2025. How many times this year, by the way, have the uncomfortable you know, equity investor said, it's time for rotation, it's time for rotation, the market's supposed to broaden out? Well, it's only going to broaden out if these top companies actually don't have the same growth trajectory that they've had over the last two years. And I don't think that's the case. I mean, I, I think parts of tech and the AI and the AI adjacent themes still have a lot of legs to go. 
So given that, are you basically recommending that clients overweight stocks, even at the past of bonds at a time where the biggest uncertainty might not be in the stock market, but at this point really is in the bond market that's closed today for a celebration of the second anniversary of the bull market? Yeah, that's correct. The mod bond market got the celebration correct. Um, I would say this, you. you know, we have been more neutral in terms of our fixed income allocation. I still think you're going to get the best juice from the equity market. But again, you have to pick your spots. The one thing that has happened throughout this past year uh, that people have not always been comfortable with is that you have had to be tactical and you had to have to be, be on your feet. Um, I don't think the kind of the set it and forget it strategy is going to be the way to go forward in the equity market. And so for this, I would say I told you I love the tech and the AI and AI adjacent themes. I think there's opportunity more in the banks as we move forward. And I'm looking if we continue to have stable growth indicators for opportunities in some of the cyclicals. But there you have to be selective. You identified three themes. Yeah. Top line growth. Yes. Expense management. Mm. And then navigating policy and political uncertainty. That's right. How are they going to navigate the politics of the next month, maybe the next four and a half years? Well, I don't think they're going to make a ton of decisions in the near term. I mean, this is the pattern we always see. The second half of the year during a big election cycle, you don't tend to get a lot of capital expenditure or new CapEx. It's mostly maintenance, for example. And, and consumers have said in, in a lot of polls and surveys more recently that they're kind of holding off on making big decisions till they understand what their tax rate is going to be if there's any changes in policy. So I think we're in a bit of a holding pattern, John, for at least you know the next few months. But next year, once we understand not just who is going to be president, but the composition of Congress, I think there's going to be a, um, a willingness to kind of embrace whatever that policy is and, and move forward. This, to me, is one of the biggest question marks. We hear about policy uncertainty. We hear about questions about potential for growth uh, in terms of earnings and margins. We hear about a reticent investor who's holding on because of risks. And then we see a fifth straight week of gains in the S&P 500, the That's longest right. streak, as, as John was mentioning, going back to May. How do you square what seems like a lack of confidence in surveys and a demonstration of confidence when it comes to allocations, inflows, as well as just performance? Look, sentiment has to be a big part of everyone's investment process. And when you have all these sentiment indicators, the surveys, you know, even some companies saying that they're concerned, they're concerned, they're concerned, that's the moment you say there might actually be opportunity, right? You know, when everyone is saying it's an all clear, there's literally nothing for us to worry about, um, we're going to pile all of our risk into the riskiest parts of the stock market, then you kind of have to back yourself off. I think in this case, the fact that people have been more reluctant bulls, that there has been you know, a fair amount of argument around the leadership, that sets us up well, I think, for uh, positioning. And we're not overly, I think the stock market is not overly owned at this point. There's still a little bit of cash on the sidelines. And if these tech companies in particular put up big numbers uh, in third quarter reporting, there's room to re-up those positions, I think, going into year end. Kate, this was great. It's always good to see you. Yeah, great to Thanks see you. Thanks for being with us. Kate Moore of BlackRock. Here stateside, looking at equity futures up by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. We need to head over to Europe. Under surveillance this morning, the road ahead for Stellantis. Shares are down by more than 40% so far this year. The automaker is shaping up its management team in a push to drive performance. I'm pleased to say that joining us now is the Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares. He joins us now from the Paris Motor Show. Carlos, welcome back to the programme, sir. It's always good to hear from you. The last time we spoke, we've had some changes. The EU has voted to impose some tariffs on Chinese automobiles. What I want to understand from you is whether you've had some Chinese car companies knock on your door dial your phone number and ask you to sell some of your brands to them. Is that happening? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, that happened in the past. In the past, uh, some Chinese uh, car companies asked me to sell them uh, some of our brands, uh, which I believe uh, is a significant asset of our uh, Stellantis company, and therefore I rejected uh, the request. And uh, we are keeping our brands and, uh, of course, doing good business uh, with them. So the answer that I gave them is no, thank you very much. Have they followed up on that request in the aftermath of that vote at the EU in the last few weeks? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. But it's obvious that uh, with our uh, Leap Motors investment and the equity that we have in Leap Motors, and most importantly, the fact that we control all of their exports outside of China, it is quite clear that we have the manufacturing footprint not only in Europe but all over the world. Uh, to bring to our partner and to ourselves uh, the manufacturing uh, sourcing that we need uh, to go uh, and do a good business out of the constraints 
that we need to manage. And of course, tariffs are a constraint, and you can go around tariffs if you uh, manufacture inside of the bubble that has been built. This is what we are offering to uh, Leap Motors. Everything that is sold outside of China is under our control through a 5149 JV called the Leap Motors International. And we are, of course, creating that value thanks to our dealer network system and our manufacturing system all, all, all over the world. This is a competitive edge of Stellantis that uh, most of our competitors uh, cannot reach right now. Carlos, give us a little bit more detail on how tariffs might impact the company. And I just want to say for the benefit of the audience, Leap Motor, of course, is a JV, a joint venture you have with a Chinese manufacturer. Some of those cars are behind you as we speak. Carlos, how are you thinking about retaliatory measures coming from the Chinese? How well insulated do you think you are from the potential of that developing? Well, first of all, what we see when we work with our partners from Leap Motors is exactly where their competitive edge is. Uh, their competitive edge is very uh, localized in a certain number of uh, systems of the car, which is good to know because that's where we need to work harder to uh, be more competitive compared to what we do today. So we see that. We also see that they have uh, the ability to be much more affordable than the Western world and then uh, meet the expectations of the consumer base that we have in the Western world, which is basically the consumers want to buy EVs at the price of ICEs. And that's exactly what they are able to do today. We are also able to do that with some of our offerings in Europe, but we need to expand this competitive edge to many other brands and many other models. So that is a competitive advantage that our company has. And uh, by having this ability with them, we can leverage their cost competitiveness, their speed to go to market, and at the same time, if needed, go around the custom duties that uh, the Western world is trying to impose on us. That also means that uh, compared to other Western world actors, we are in a much better position for the future than some of them. Carlos, can you just elaborate on that? Are you basically saying that the only way to really provide cost-effective EVs to a European consumer is to get around some of the up to 45% tariffs that the EU just voted on? What I'm saying is that we are leveraging uh, a strategy that is... Uh, uh, based on two major pillars. There is one pillar with Leap Motors that brings EV technology at the price of ICE, despite the tariffs that you are uh, mentioning, because we can go around the tariffs by manufacturing the cars inside of the bubble. That's one. On the other side, we have a dedicated platform that we call the smart car platform that we are using to bring uh, uh, compact cars to the market, like the new Citroën C3, that we bring to the market at uh, 20, 23,000 euros, which is the core of the market in terms of pure EV. And that price is extremely competitive. It's uh, on par with the Chinese capability. And that kind of offering is also profitable for Stellantis. So not only we have the pillar of Fleet Motor, which is very strategic, we also have the internal pillar, which is the smart car platform that we are now using, for example, for the C3 Citroën hatchback, but also for the C-Cross crossover version, and many other models will follow, Fiat models, but also Opel models, and that is going to bring a lot of competitiveness to the market. So what I'm saying is that Stellantis is in a perfect condition to leverage affordability with profitability and zero emission in the near future. Carlos, how important is it in order to uh, retain profitability and increase going forward, how important is it to pare back certain brands that aren't performing as well and that don't fit within those targets, I'm thinking in particular, in North America? In North America, we have a very specific uh, problem, which is a very operational problem, not, not at all rocket science. Uh, in North America, we got trapped by... Uh, a marketing plan on the second quarter of 24 that was very audacious, very daring, and it didn't work, it failed. So we got trapped by that marketing plan, and then we needed some time to discuss the best way to rebound with our US dealers, which we did. I did it personally uh, in August this year. Now we have a new, let's say, more conventional plan that is uh, uh, active, and it's working very well. Over the last three months, we could reduce our US dealer inventory by 52,000 vehicles. And we will be, before the end of this year, before Christmas, below uh, the ceiling of 330,000 vehicles, which we consider is the ceiling for a normalized inventory. This problem is now being fixed. 
It's not rocket science. We have discussed it with our dealer body. I think we have the right, uh, the right dynamics right now, and uh, we expect this to be fixed this year. So that was what happened. Regarding the brands, the brands are very healthy. The Ram brand, the Jeep brand, with all the new models that we are bringing, the Dodge brand, but also very soon the new Chrysler models. I think they are very healthy. We just need to do a proper operational work in terms of way to go to market and collaboration with our dealers. I think we have the capability to do that. And I believe that Ram and Jeep are already leading the way in terms of the market share recovery that you can see as we improved our market share between uh, September and July from 7.2 to 8.0%. So market share is up, inventories are down, they will be normalized by Christmas, and I think we are back on a, a quite nice trend, but uh, now we need to deliver the results. This is what our investors and the community of investors expect from us. Carlos, are you open to selling any brands? Not necessarily. Uh, I'm not necessarily open on that. Of course, we consider any offerings or any proposals like in any open-minded business team, as we consider we are. So if there are proposals, we'll study. But we are not seeking any sale of any of our brands right now. That's very clear. Because last time we spoke, you talked about corrective action. You've got a mandate until, I believe, the end of 2026 as the CEO of this company. I shared some of the details, the stats on the overcapacity across the European auto manufacturing sector. You're familiar with them. They're worth repeating. Nearly a third of the major car plants from Europe's Big Five are producing half the vehicles they have the capacity to make. And I'm sitting here, Carlos, just wondering, when are we going to make the decision to make the corrective decisions that seemingly need to take place? One of two things needs to happen. Either you cut capacity or European politicians, governments are going to come out with the right kind of demand side incentives to buy the vehicles because that's not there right now. When do we actually face the reality check? Is it this year? Is it next year? How much longer can we hold on with excess capacity? Your, your comment is very valid. It is quite clear that um, right now we only ask two things to the governments and specifically the European governments. We ask stability of the rules. We do not ask for any kind of postponement because we are ethically committed to contribute to fixing the global warming. So we don't ask for any postponement. We ask for stability from one side. And from the other side, we ask the governments to stimulate the demand, which is not to help Stellantis, but to help the consumer so that the consumer can buy EVs at an affordable price, i.e. at the same price of IC. So that's what we are telling them. We'll see if they have the capability to do so. And uh, if not, then we'll have to take decisions, as you say. I assume that those, ne those decisions will be made in the next few months. I think before the end of the year, if nothing happens, we'll have to make those decisions. That's absolutely clear. Carlos, just to sit on that, because this is really important, your message to the European government and governments, national governments across the continent, they've got two, three months to get their act together, otherwise you're going to have to close plants? We had a very good uh, concrete example that um, you reported in the media about our dialogue with the UK government about the ZEV mandate. The ZEV mandate in the UK uh, had a, a threshold that was the double of the natural market demand. So if you need to put in the market the double of the natural market demand in terms of pure zero emission vehicles, of course, it has a cost. It has a cost, and if there is a cost, then we need to compensate for that cost with additional uh, decisions that will compensate for that cost. That dialogue has been uh, ongoing for several months. We are now reaching uh, a point where we have to make a decision, and again, that will happen in the next few weeks. If the governments want us to sell a mix of BEVs that is above the natural demand of the market, they need to help to stimulate the demand so that we can reach that level of ZEV mandate without destroying the profitability of the companies. If that is the case, then we need to restore that profitability to ensure the sustainability of the company because we are trying to meet a ZEV mandate that is not what the natural market demand is. So that's the situation, which is, I think, a big opportunity for Stellantis. Because Stellantis is among the companies that has the highest number of BEVs on sale. By the end of this year, we'll have 40 models on sale. On the B segment only, hatchback and SUV, we have 16 models on this 
most important segment in the European market. So we have the offering, we have the technology, we have the appealing products, we have the design, we have everything. We just need to stimulate the demand and help the middle class consumer to fix the affordability problem that we still have in our hands. Carlos, I've got to squeeze one extra question in. I know you're busy. A European auto manufacturer's investable right now. Your stock is down by more than 40%. What on earth do you tell investors? As we're in between this horrible window right now where either you're going to have to do one thing or the government's going to have to do something else. But in between, it's so difficult for an investor to make a decision to buy your stock. What's the message you give investors right now? Well, I, I perfectly understand uh, why they are puzzled, and uh, uh, I'm sorry for that. It is quite clear that um, we are going to go back to them very soon to tell them that we have fixed the uh, U.S. Uh, dealer inventory issue. This is the number one thing we need to fix. It's very operational. It's not rocket science. And I understand this is the number one priority. I think we are on the right trend as we reduced the inventory by 52,000 vehicles in the last three months. The dynamics are good. We expect to reach a level that is below the ceiling of 330,000 by the end of this year. I soon, as soon as this landing is in my hands, which I think it will very soon, I will go back to them to explain to them that that problem is fixed. And then I will leverage all the other competitive edges that we have on our company, which I believe are very big in terms of technology, in terms of bringing the right EVs with the right performance to the market, in terms of strategic partnerships like the one we have with Leap Motors. So uh, they will see me back very soon, but first I need to take care of my homeworks because that's my responsibility, and I'm excited about fixing those issues. Well, hopefully we see you back very soon as well, sir. Once again, you've been very generous with your time, and we appreciate it. The Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares, on the latest difficulties for the auto manufacturing sector across Europe and ugly worldwide, with the exception of some of the Chinese brands right now. Yeah, and repeating what we heard earlier, the idea of uh, some sort of way to incentivize consumers to buy electric vehicles in Europe so that they can do so at an affordable price. That sort of being a, a benchmark idea that a lot of people are looking for. Let's turn to Craig Trudell, who followed that conversation closely. Bloomberg's very own. Craig, your thoughts on that, that we're getting to crunch time here. We've got a few months left. Either the European governments get their act together and make a decision, or we're going to see some serious cuts. Yeah, I, I think your last question was the right one, which is, you know, how is how is uh, a stock like Stellantis is, uh, possibly investable in this in this, uh, you know, sort of paradigm? And I do think that, you know, with all due respect uh, to, to Mr. Tavares, you know, I, I think the the answer there was I, I think you know less less than satisfactory. Uh, essentially, you're, you're going to have to wait for me to do my homework and sort of you know come back with you uh, come back to you with more. Uh, you know I, I think it, it is the case that this is a company that is very much caught in a in a sort of paradigm of, of you know challenges uh, with the the state of the industry over here and they are far from alone. But for him to sort of you know uh, downplay the extent of the the issues they've had is you know simply a matter of a, a second quarter marketing plan that was too ambitious that they you know didn't pull off. I think just understates the the issues that that you know Stellantis has has been having that go back far more than just the second quarter of this year, where they you know they've they've been making too many cars, making too many you know higher spec, higher price cars, and trying to sort of you know uh, prolong this. Uh, period of, of uh, you know good times for for the industry uh, longer than it was clear you know the market had had tolerance for or, or appetite for. How much are the purchase incentives that seem to be a theme this morning something that policymakers in Europe truly are prepared to do? I think we're we're hearing uh, actually even just uh, in Germany just in the last couple of days uh, you know a, a, an interest in sort of you know taking another look at at the subsidies that were taken off the table about a year ago and a, a realization that that was you know a grave mistake I think you you need to look no further than uh, you know the way that the German uh, market ha has played out since that decision was made and you know, it's a very clear conclusion you have to draw that EVs were just not ready to stand on their own t uh, two feet yet. Uh, when you when you pulled those subsidies out of the market, we saw a, a huge pullback in demand, uh, and and it's just clear that you know the EV industry needs subsidies in order to sus sustain the momentum that we've seen the last few years. And we're not ready for for the consumer to to purchase those cars without some help. Yeah. Or plants are closing and jobs are going to be lost. It's that simple, Craig.
Craig Trudeau of Bloomberg. We talked a lot about Germany and VW. Stellantis in Italy, just to share some numbers. The Fiat 500 was the jewel in the crown for Fiat for a long, long time. They produced an electric one. They've had to suspend production. That was the news out of Turin. Torino over the last few months. Manufacturing of Fiat and Maserati for the first nine months of the year in Italy down 41%. We're talking about taking out the depths of 2020 in the pandemic. That's how bad output's been. There's a real structural problem and time is running out. And that's what policymakers are being asked to address right now. It's a difficult moment. It's very, very difficult to invest in some of these manufacturers until we get some real visibility on the future. Sonia Meskin of UBS, Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark join us next. We're looking ahead to U.S. retail sales and another read on the American economy. Programming note in 60 minutes time. Don't miss this one. Keir Starmer, the British Prime Minister, sitting down with Bloomberg Stephanie Flanders, 9.30 Eastern time. That's 2.30 in London on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. It's been a very difficult first 100 days for this leader. He's getting together business leaders from all around the world in the UK this morning and trying to convince them that the focus is on growth. There's a big budget coming up a little bit later this month. We're looking ahead to that and looking for some clues from this guy a little bit later. That conversation 60 minutes away. One hour away also from the opening bell with equity futures right now on the S&P 500, firmer by two tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq, we're up by a third, just a little bit of underperformance on a small caps on a Russell. With your morning movers, let's cross over to Danny Berger. Morning, Danny. Good morning, John. Boeing under pressure this morning. Over the weekend, we learned that they were going to cut about 10% of their staff. That's 17,000 employees. Pre-market shares down 2%. Nick, Nick Cunningham of Agency, an analyst there, saying that this is not a coherent plan and it is all very hand-to-mouth. The CEO, Kelly Ortberg, saying that they could take more dramatic action if things don't improve. They're heading into month two of their strike. Meanwhile, a firm, the buy now, pay later company, higher this morning, up nearly 2%, an upgrade from Webbush. We know lots of people are using buy now, pay later. Webbush says the macro environment is getting better for these companies. Lower rates are helping. Helping the credit condition is still good with all expectations of a soft landing. Finally, rounding things out with Sirius XM, the radio satellite provider, up nearly three and a half. Percent. This all thanks to Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, a filing late on Friday that they've been buying up the stock for the good half of last week. They spent 3.6 million shares with $87 million as the price tag on that. They now earn 32% of the company, easily a majority uh, for that company. Though these shares, John, they've been down some 50% year to date, even with that buying. Danny, thank you. Appreciate the update. The latest there. So we're dropping Bank of America and we're buying... Sirius XM. That's right? what I was thinking about. I mean, it's not really analogous considering the scale of the uh, position in Bank of America Very versus what it's a, it's a different sort of size and scope, but it does sort of fly on the face of this idea that Berkshire Hathaway is hoarding cash rather than trying to invest in companies on the margins. We'll get some numbers from Bank of America later this week, some numbers from Goldman, from City, from Morgan Stanley. That's the next 48 hours for earnings on Wall Street. Markets also looking ahead to Thursday's data points, including retail sales and another round of jobless claims. Sonia Meskin of UBS writing, the next marker for the strength of the consumer will come with retail sales. It follows up a streak of relatively robust September data. We continue to see upside risk to initial claims from storm strikes and seasonality. Sonia joins us now for more. Sonia, storm strikes and seasonality, not necessarily about then general cyclical weakness in the economy. Is that fair? Uh, yes, it's there. And, it, you know, it will be difficult uh, to disentangle uh, the temporary factors from the underlying trajectory of both the consumer and, of course, the labor market. So we would expect the initial claims to uh, to begin to rise simply because of those um, idiosyncratic factors that you have cited. Uh, but, of course, we believe the market will be quite focused on uh, the underlying trend as well. So, Sonia, you've got to come up with a jobs number for November 1st, for the month of October. I feel your pain. How are you going to do that? It'll be hard. It'll be hard while we're working through it right now. And of course, the, the story is evolving just as we work on it. Um, but uh, it could it could very well be that uh, the September numbers were uh, the cleanest um, that we might get this year. Sonia, how much uh, we were talking to Neela Richardson earlier, she was saying that in some ways retail sales might be more instructive than the payrolls report that we get next month simply because of just how messy it is. Do you agree with that? 
Um, well, the retail sales could be volatile, um, and uh, the, the the jobs numbers are, of course, uh, in focus because that's part of the FOMC's mandate. Um, but the the consumer is really a key lever here. Um, as long as the consumer is strong, as long as the consumer is spending, um, we will continue having a strong economy, and that would fuel into uh, growth and jobs. Given that, do you think, Sonia, that it's actually realistic that Rafael Bostic could be the front runner here, that a pause next month in terms of rate cuts might be warranted as they assess just how much weakness or not is in the economy? Well, it's interesting, you know, the minutes came out last week, and um, of course, our interpretation of the minutes was in part the 50 basis point cut in September was a catch up to what they perceived to have started too late and not having cut in July. Um, but given the noisiness of the data and given that the seasonality factors are changing and it's hard to cut through all of that to the underlying trend, um, we think the most likely path is still for them to stick to 25 basis points at each of the next subsequent meetings. My takeaway from the minutes was that Chairman Pound bullied them all into going 50. How wide are the mark am I, Sonia? Isn't that what it sounded like? Well, uh, it sounded like there may have been more disagreement, um, in fact, around this 50 basis point cut um, than perhaps Chair Powell expressed in the press conference right after the meeting. We saw that in the SCP. We also heard this from the Fed speakers after the meeting as well, including last week. You said something interesting about the month of September. You said it might be the cleanest read we get on the economy this year. Sonia, are you saying that October, November, December data might just be distorted right the way through to year end? Well, I think the NFP may be distorted, especially, um, you know, for in, uh, the, the next number um, that's going to come out in November. Um, it will be uh, difficult to disentangle some of the effects from the weather and the strikes um, to the actual trend. And of course, we didn't see that come through in September. Given that, Sonia, how much are earnings really going to be the number one indicator that a lot of people are going to look to, given the fact that we are starting earnings season and that so far it seems like everyone's looking for that weakness and not finding it? Earnings are very important. Um, uh, they're important in the sense that they all also gauge uh, A, the consumer, but B, uh, the health of the corporate sector as well. And um, we do believe that uh, fundamentally, because the data is uh, on the economic side is noisy, earnings are, just as you say, are important as a secondary factor, even for the economists to look at. I know that the bond market's closed. They have it right today. Stock market's still open. Uh, I am wondering, though, about your interpretation of the massive sell-off that we've seen in bond yields over the past month. The fact that we've seen a 41% retracement in this year's rally, a 45 basis point increase in terms of 10-year yields going back since September 16th. Do you think this is the market getting it right? That essentially the Fed can cut rates a few more times, but really can't cut that significantly because of the ultimate underlying strength, despite how high relative rates are. Well, it, the question around the financial conditions is a very good question, right? Because in, in essence, if the Fed is easing, financial conditions should ease too. Uh, but if the Fed is you know, easing, but rates are going up, that may not necessarily be happening. Um, and we believe the market is, is effectively just like the Fed is watching every data point um, and trying to gauge in, in real time what the Fed is going to do in the next few months. Uh, that's difficult to do. And one of our scenarios, not our central scenario, but one of our scenarios is a re in the economy. And in that scenario, the Fed will have to, you know, even after cutting them, pausing, uh, would have to start raising rates again, uh, because it would turn out that the consumer um, is quite a bit stronger than originally expected. The wealth effect is still there. Um, and that would put upward pressure on inflation as well. Again, not our base case. Our base case is uh, um, actually slowing to trend um, and the FOMC stabilizing uh, the policy rate at two or three quarters to 3% around um, next summer. Uh, but one of our risk scenarios is for sure a reacceleration. How election dependent is that risk scenario, Sonia? Does that depend on the outcome of November? So interestingly, we've done some research around that, and it seems like from the uh, proposals that we've seen, the blue sweep versus red sweep, the effect is actually not as strong and as I think some of the, in the media uh, would lead us to believe. Uh, the biggest impact would be in, uh, from all out tariffs. Sonia Meskin of UBS. Sonia, appreciate it, as always. Need Anne Marie around the table. She's going to be back tomorrow to break down some of these scenarios. Reacceleration risk, the real risk. Adam Poston's talked about the same thing. He does think 
it's election dependent. That essentially, if Trump gets elected, then inflation goes up, tariffs uh, get implemented, and you start to see the Fed being forced to raise rates next year. It's hard to get your mind around what scenarios to actually put into place. My big question mark, or what are the checks on either candidate to know whether their policies are going over well? There is an assumption in business circles that Donald Trump uses the stock market as a check on his policies and that the stock market sells off, he will adjust course. Will that be the case? Unclear. What's Kamala Harris's check? Is there going to be something in that place as well? Victoria Fernandez joins us now to continue the conversation, joins us from Crossmark Global Investors. Victoria, welcome to the program. I was going through your notes on the labor market, the labor differential. Plentiful versus hard to get jobs, see that in consumer confidence, not great. ISM components for employment, not great. Cyclical employment, not seeing big gains there either. So even if we park jobless claims and say that's just the hurricane effect, are you suggesting the cracks in the labour market are bigger than some people suggest they are? I think they are. Those elements that you're talking about, Jonathan, are perfect examples of kind of that underlying effect that people maybe aren't looking at as much as just that headline number. Yes, there's seasonal effects that go on, but look at those components. Cyclical employment is a key element, and we've talked about it before um, as something to really watch and give you an insight into how the economy is growing. When you have non-cyclical employment that is leading, when you have those jobs like healthcare, education, government jobs, those are those non-cyclical components, that's not giving you the strength in the market that you really want to have this sustainable move forward. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Cyclical components down, non-cyclical up. Temporary hiring is another one that's seen as a leading indicator in the labor market. That's continuing to come down. And even at the small business report that came out last week, they're telling you the same things. We're stabilizing hiring. We're not going to do much there. Our CapEx intentions are coming down. Revenue looks like it's going to be difficult to maintain. Those are all elements, in our opinion, that say the labor market probably does have wider cracks, which is why we continue to be a little bit guarded about this market, because we know that that can lead to more layoffs. Well, that view versus the price of the story, let's talk about the price of the story. Equities, all-time highs, credit spreads, both right. investment grade and high yield, incredibly tight. Is that a source of comfort or a source of anxiety? <laughs> I guess if I'm anxious about the labor market, that does give me a little bit of comfort to say, well, you know, people are looking at these elements and saying we see this, but it's the credit market that I think a lot of people are saying, look, they're not seeing any worries there. Look at the gap that we see right now between the VIX and credit spreads. It's a really large gap and you usually don't see that. In our opinion, you know, credit spreads typically tend to be more correct on that. And I think that's what the market is saying. The VIX is gonna come back down, that's positive for equities. So the market continues to have this momentum, um, but you look a little bit under the hood and we see, look at the number of stocks that are trading at 20 day highs. It's really low, it's like at 16%. So again, is this sustainable or is the market just getting a little bit ahead of itself like it has multiple times over the last couple of years? We're not saying don't be in the market. You can't stand in the way of the momentum that's there. But I do think you need to be guarded because of these elements we're talking about. What does that mean, Victoria? How do you remain guarded as you do see cracks in a labor market that aren't being discussed, at least in earnings that we've seen so far? Right. So. If you're gonna be invested in the market and you're gonna be in equities, we wanna look at some of those areas that maybe um, you're seeing some leadership changes. And we've seen that a lot in industrials, which typically do well when the economy is doing better. But again, find some industrials that have the strong balance sheets, the good cash flows. We like financials. I know, Jonathan, you always ask me, why financials if you don't think the economy is doing well? But we see the markets tending to look through some of the um, not as impressive components of the earnings that we saw from JP Morgan, uh, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo last week. And those balance sheets are strong and continue to do well in a steepening yield curve. So financials look well, but look at some of the places like Staples. 
healthcare. Those sectors have come down. We think there's opportunities there that you can add to have a little bit of upside. And Lisa, it wouldn't be an interview with you and I both sitting here together if we didn't talk about adding some fixed income to your portfolio. I know spreads are tight, but what we're seeing is they continue to hold these tight levels. So I think you can add some fixed income and get some cash flow in your portfolio. Fixed income on the credit side or fixed income on the rate side, given the fact that you have seen a backup particularly on the longer end on the 10-year yield? Or do you go into credit because you're getting an extra spread with companies that have pretty good balance sheets, albeit very narrow relative to recent history? Right. And I think you can do a little bit of both. We are adding to our credit positions, but we're adding in high quality, right? In investment grade um, names that we like, where we're not concerned about cash flows for those companies. We know they can meet those principal and income components. We're not dipping our toe into high yield, um, just like we're not going too much into small caps either on the equity side. So we're trying to limit um, the credit risk that we have there, but also take advantage of that steepening yield curve. Go out a little bit further on your duration and lock that in. The 10-year yield seems to be a little bit overbought right now. We knew we would have a change as the market repriced rate cut expectations. So lock in a little bit of that yield on the longer end. You mentioned financials, Victoria. Tomorrow we're going to hear from City Goldman Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, the day after. Victoria, what weren't you convinced by on Friday when we saw numbers from JP Morgan and Wells Fargo? What was unconvincing to you? Well, I think there's some elements in there. Obviously, your net interest margins, your net interest income, people are really focused on those um, on those numbers. Some of those did not impress uh, to the same level that many people were expecting, especially on the Wells Fargo side. But you're still seeing um, credit card elements that are doing well. You're seeing deposits and credit growth that is hanging in there. Um, you know, obviously, when you look at the market elements within the financials, that area is doing well and generating growth. So I think there's positives there. We like these names were invested. I do think there were some elements that people said, you know what, this might be a little choppy over the next 18 months or so, but these banks are going to be fine. Um, and that's why I think you can go ahead and hop in there. We always have to watch credit cards, especially when you're looking at Bank of America that's really consumer focused. Delinquency is moving up a little bit there, but still seem to be doing pretty well. We'll see how those numbers turn out this week. So you're not spo spooked by the comments from Ally Financial a few weeks back in conference season? Well, Ally Financial is a little bit different. We actually don't have exposure to Ally Financial in our um, separately managed accounts. We like those larger banks. Again, going back to our focus on balance sheets, those are the areas that we want to focus. JP Morgan, Bank of America, those being our largest holdings within that sector. So we would stay away from more of what we call the regional banks or some of the smaller banks and focus on those that have that strong cash position. Victoria, you didn't mention energy anywhere in there. Have we gone uh, gone past that time where energy companies were leveraged in some way to the global cycle and now move basically to a tune of their own. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, a lot of it depends on what's coming out of OPEC headlines. But look, we have these geopolitical events. Maybe you get a day or two of some volatility around energy names, but then it seems to flatten out again. So you're right. There seems to be this disconnect um, that is coming here. But if we want to look at companies and focus on balance sheets, energy companies are doing well in that sense. They have that strong cash flow. Those balance sheets and cash ratios look good there. Um, and so I think you can have some exposure. I mean, I'm sitting here in Houston. I don't want to say ignore the energy companies, put some exposure there. But if there is quite a bit of volatility, again, we don't know what's going to happen on the geopolitical front. So that could give um, even more volatility than what we've seen as of late. So maybe be a little cautious there. But I think over the long term, these are names you want to have in your portfolio. They won't let you outside. Victoria, it's good to see you. Victoria <laughs> Fernandez across Smart Global Investments on energy there at the end. Just before on the financials, the banks on the S&P 500. On the week last week, up by almost 5%, the best week of the year. Missed that. Biggest weekly gain of the year so far for the banks on the S&P last week. They beat pretty much across the board. A couple of wobbles here and there, but across J.P. Morgan, certainly uh, very much excess versus what people had expected. There is a prospect that it could continue, and there aren't that many negative clouds. The fact that Wells Fargo looked for consumers to show weakness and couldn't find it tells you a lot.
More bank earnings through the week. You'll hear from Citi, Goldman, Bank of America and Morgan Stanley with an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. OPEC has cut its forecast for oil demand growth through year-end for a third consecutive month. The organization now predicts that global oil consumption will increase by 1.9 million barrels a day. That's down around 2% from its previous call. OPEC's efforts to shore up falling oil prices have been undermined by countries that have failed to deliver their cutbacks, like Iraq, Kazakhstan, and Russia. Other headwinds include slowing growth in China and swelling supplies from the Americas. Renault has unveiled a made-in-France EV priced under 35,000 euros. The R4e Tech is meant to help the automaker better compete with budget offerings from Chinese manufacturers. It will have a range of about 250 miles on a single charge and include a chat GPT-powered digital assistant. Renault is introducing a range of affordable EVs to counter a slowdown in demand. And SpaceX pulled off an incredible technological feat on Sunday after launching its Starship rocket into orbit. The company achieved its first ever chopsticks landing, catching the rocket's over 200-foot fall booster out of the air with giant mechanical arms at the launch site. The recovery marked a historical milestone for spaceflight, with the reusability of the rocket booster seen as a critical step towards developing more advanced space travel. And that's your brief, John. Hey, Danny, thanks for this morning. I could watch that on repeat again and again. Just absolutely phenomenal. Up next on this program, setting you up for the day ahead. We'll get you the week ahead with big bank earnings reporting, a lot of economic data, and one big central bank decision in the mix as well. That's up next. This is Bloomberg. Thirty-seven minutes away from the opening bell, equity futures just about firmer by two tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, one hundred up by four tenths on a Russell. The small caps up by a tenth of one percent. Earnings season picking up through the week. I'll get to the calendar in just a moment. Following five weeks of gains on the S&P 500, looking to add some weight to that rally this morning. As we count you down to the opening bell, let's get to that calendar. The week ahead looks like this. Today, we'll get Fed speak from Kashgari and Waller. On Tuesday, Bramo sitting down with the San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. Look out for that. That's must watch. Plus earnings from Bank of America, City, Goldman Sachs and United Airlines. On to Wednesday, we'll hear from Morgan Stanley. On to Thursday, an ECB rate decision. Will they cut interest rates? Why wouldn't they cut interest rates on Thursday? Big debate going into Thursday around that theme. Plus, we'll get retail sales and another round of jobless claims after jobless claims spiked higher just last week. We'll see if we get a repeat this week with another hurricane disruption potentially also on the cards. And we'll get results from Netflix and TSMC before we get to Friday. We get housing starts and building permits. Pretty stacked week for the week ahead. And it has three prongs to it. It has the policy aspect of it, ECB. Not only will they cut rates, but how much will they signal that they will continue to cut them going forward? It has the economic data, the retail sales that Neil Richardson was saying was more important, arguably, for the Fed than the next payrolls report, just because that will be so messy. And we cannot overemphasize the earnings this season, given how high expectations are. Some people argue they're not that high and how strong they've been so far. And we have not seen that consumer weakness. So you double barrel this idea of not only the banks, but ASML of TSMC, a forward look to maybe some of the tech names. And you start to get a more fuller picture of exactly what it looks like on the ground right now. Let's unpack some of the points you've made and maybe just sit on the data. I think your point on the economic data is really important. It's interesting how economists on Wall Street are preparing their clients for a October payrolls report in early November that will make absolutely no sense and will offer you no real read through, no clean read through into the US economy. Why aren't we getting more of that from Fed officials? Why aren't Fed officials out there saying the same thing, that the last clean data read that they got on the jobs market was the last one before going into November 7th. Shouldn't they be doing the same thing? Yeah, should they have a cohesive message that gives a little bit more direction? Maybe. They don't. <laughs> right now, it's unclear exactly how much people are on the same page, how much, as you pointed out earlier, Fed Chair Jay Powell really was the one driving the ship and everybody else got in line. Unclear exactly what the compass is. In a data-dependent Federal Reserve, what is the data that really is going to shift the needle? I do think the earnings might take on greater importance as well as the anecdotal evidence, the beige book. 
as people start to understand where the forward-looking momentum is for the consumer at a time where business owners don't have a lot of visibility into what's going to happen. We're setting this market up for a really messy week. So you get tons of economic data, you get lots of earnings between now and the start of November, then it begins. November 1, jobs report, could be a total mess. November 5th, election. May or may not get a result the morning after. November 7th, the Federal Reserve is going to sit down as a committee on a Thursday, on a Thursday this time, and try and make the right kind of policy decision with everything all in mind. Yeah. That's well, going to be a difficult week. Or do we have a pause, like Raphael Bostic said, at a time of great uncertainty? A lot of decisions for them. A lot to work through this week as well. Tomorrow, Max Kettner of HSBC, Ken Leon of CFRA, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods, Kathy Boschancic of Nationwide. From New York, this is Bloomberg.